And as we get organized in about uh, two or three minutes, which only puts us ten minutes late, we will start the seven o'clock council meeting. That's what you get for putting us down here. <laughs> I, I will call the uh, April 16, 2013 City Council meeting to order. For those of you who are watching the beginning of the meeting or in preparation for the meeting, there is one chair that doesn't work, and often there's a lottery in terms of which one of us gets that chair. And Deputy Mayor Farrell was the winner of the lottery today. And so in case you were wondering why we were doing what we were doing. Um, on that happy note, we're going to start with the Pledge of Allegiance and uh, Mr. Mayor. Thank <laughs> you. 
thank you all for coming tonight. Um, before we begin our presentations, uh, I'd like to make two thoughts. The first is uh, we lost a very, very important and valuable member of the Federal Way team, uh, Pat Foster, who worked uh, for the city for 17 years. Uh, Pat had a long title, but his greatest role many of you probably benefited from was when there was a snowstorm and other cities uh, and other residents of cities couldn't get out of their garages, uh, Pat was an integral part of the response that we have on a storm-by-storm -storm basis and then, of course, uh, did so much more for our team here in the city of Federal Way. And so our thoughts and prayers are with Pat's family and our thanks to him for all the outstanding work that he did on behalf of our community. In addition, I also want to take a moment to say that on behalf of the council, the city staff, and the community, our thoughts and prayers are also with the victims of the Boston attack and their families. Uh, that is very personal to many of us. Um, Jean has a family member, a daughter in Boston. Uh, my daughter is in Boston, and she had texted me the night before that she was very excited about the marathon. And the year before, she had been at the finish line. This year, she got trapped in the library, but so was more fortunate than many others. And then, of course, <coughs> Councilmember Duclos uh, comes from Massachusetts, Deanie. Uh, any thoughts? Yeah, I'd just like us to take a moment of, of silence uh, in honor of the people that died and the people that got injured, injured out there. Um, Patriots Day in Massachusetts is very, very important. That was Lexington and Concord. That was the start of the revolution. And every school kid knew the history of the American Revolution. And we've been, we were very proud of it. We all had little Patriots Day parades in our, in our towns. And I remember as a brownie and a Girl Scout marching in the parades. And as older, I remember going into Boston to the marathon, which is a race that uh, attracts people from all over the world. And for somebody to do something so outrageous like this, to harm innocent people, especially that young child that lost his, his life, um, it's just unfathomable. But the one thing about Bostonians and people from Massachusetts and all of us in this country, we are strong, we bounce back, and we will find who did it. But our hearts and prayers should be with the people right now, all of the people of Massachusetts and all of those people that were injured. And so I'd like us to take a moment of prayer, for, a moment of silence if we could. Thank you all. Okay. I think it's particularly fitting that our first presentation tonight is a proclamation in support of the National Day of Prayer. As all of you know, prayer has a vital role in the lives of Americans, providing solace during difficult times uh, as we experienced, in fact, so recently in Boston, and thoughts of gratitude during good times. Praying is fundamental spiritual practice that Americans of diverse religions share in common, and a community as diverse as Federal Way, expressing ourselves through prayer is a common thread that unites us. If Coach Roach will come to the podium, I'll read the proclamation on the National Day of Prayer signed by all council members and the mayor. Whereas April 17, 1952, the Congress of the United States approved the joint resolution to provide for setting aside an appropriate day as a national day of prayer. Nope. And whereas the governor of the state of Washington has proclaimed a day of prayer in Washington State on May 2, 2013. And whereas the history of our nation is indelibly marked with the role that prayer has played in the lives of individuals in the nation. And whereas historically our greatest leaders have turned to prayer in times of crises and thanksgiving. And whereas the virtues of prayer reflect a common bond, hopes and aspirations, sorrows and fears, remorse and renewed resolve, 
thanks Everybody and joyful them. praise and love. Now, therefore, we, the undersigned mayor and city council of the city of Federal Way, mm -hmm. do hereby proclaim May 2nd, 2013 as the National Day of Prayer in the city of Federal Way in keeping with the wishes of the state of Washington and the Congress of the United States and encourage all residents to join in this special observance. Again, I'm going to be coming over and giving this to Coach Roach, a friend of mine for over 20 years who has done remarkable things in our community for so many. So thank you, Coach, for being here tonight. Do I get dessert? Uh, <laughs> I see you, you, you plan your food so you gotta get people here, is that it? We, uh, we are creative. We use frugal innovation to, pr to, to promote democracy, Coach, and this is another example of it. But having said that, the microphone is yours. Oh, hey, gee whiz. Hey, Rose Eel is one of our board members on Pray Federal Way. We've been in existence about 15 years or so. Been trying to get people to work together and pray together at least once a year, but we do more than that. Uh, a National Day of Prayer, I've put Mark Malosius, who's going to be our Master of Ceremonies this time. Uh, Caleb Dawson, if you haven't met young T Caleb, he's the president of the Fredway Student Body. And he's a neat bro he's a neat boy, neat young man. Roger Freeman, who normally set up here, is now uh, uh, with the state of California. I mean, state of Washington, and uh, and he will be there at our prayer breakfast. He has cancer now. You guys, that disease—that's a horrible word. I've got one in my family right now, and now we got here. We have uh, the that Roger's got. It has a disease, and he announced that at the, at the uh, governor's prayer breakfast. The other element in here is a relation that I want you guys to see is connected. I started with a little group of men and women in downtown uh, Seattle 77 years ago. And that little prayer group has scattered its now for I have one element of this on the governor's prayer breakfast and the presidential prayer breakfast all came in tied. They started here in Seattle. And we have, it's all over the world now. And there's over 2,000 countries that have prayer breakfast time. Now, because we, we did it, and we just keep doing it, men go, people go from here to Washington, D.C. to put the presidential prayer breakfast together. So anyway, that's, that's sort of the agenda. I have a, a I want to follow on that prayer thing. Uh, I, 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 on my list here to you, Mr. Mayor, was to, we ought to think about having a, a prayer time, even if it's silent, like Dee Dee did, to have prayer here in this in the chamber whenever you guys meet every week. So I'm suggesting that we do it at Rotary. Why can't we do it here? So that's just a thought. Anyway, that's I'm involved with the homeless and we have people here, hundreds of them in, in the neighborhood in Federal Way. And so we, uh, we are looking forward to a successful prayer breakfast. So you are all invited. Uh, it's not all free though. <laughs> so, what's the date and where is it going to be? Coached? May the second at the mall, in uh, front of in front of Macy's, and we will have a couple hundred people in there. We've done this now every year. And it starts when? At seven in the morning. At seven in the morning. So Macy's, May second, seven in the morning. Right. Okay. May I stop now? <laughs> you, you did Rose, right. you want to say two thousand words? <laughs> No, please come. It's a wonderful event, and it's neat to see the community involved. Coach, thank you. We have 101 churches in Federal Way. I thought you'd like to know that. i got a list of all of them. <laughs> <laughs> I want them to work together. I probably attended all of them. Thank oh, you again, oh, one Coach. A, one oh, other one thing. thing. <laughs> this hat, is, uh, we're number one in America. We represent Federal Way. We are in Seattle. But we're 80, 80 year old softball team. We're number one in the United States. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Our next proclamation is Barber Shop Harmony Days on May 3rd and May 4th. And Councilmember Honda, would you present the proclamation? Yes. Uh, Barber Shop Quartet Singing is a true American art form with a tradition kept alive and vibrant by talented community singing groups. Tonight we have with us representatives from the Federal Way Harmony Kings, the Harmony Knights Quartet, 
the Jet City Sweet Adeline Ch Chorus, the Midday Melody Man, and the Northwest Sound. Would those, the people involved in those groups please go to the podium while I continue reading? The Harmony Kings have called Federal Way home for over 50 years. With the Harmony Knights Quartet, the Jet City Sweet Adeline Chorus, and the Midday Melody Men having joined them in the community. These choruses and quartets have often been seen and heard performing at civic functions in the area, and they provide entertainment to the young and old alike. The Federal Way Harmony Kings, together with the Bellevue Northwest Sound Barbership, Barbershop Choruses, are sponsoring the Western Washington Barbershop Quartet and Chorus Competition in Federal Way on May 3rd and 4th, 2013. In conjunction with this contest, they are sponsoring a high school a capa, capella contest that will involve schools from Federal Way and from as far north as Ballard and as south as Bellarmine High School in Tacoma. Joyful music will fill the air in Federal Way on these days. I will read the proclamation and then the Harmony Kings will entertain us with this song. Well. Proclamation, Barbership Harmony Days in Federal Way. Whereas, four-part men's quartet singing was a feature of the musical scene in America in the early 1900s and became a staple of the Chattanooga circuit and other entertainment venues from 1890 through the 1920s, and whereas the Society for the Preservation and Encouragement of Barbershop Quartet Singing in America was formed in 1938, eventually becoming the Barbershop Harmony Society, and it is now celebrating its 75th year in the United States and throughout the world. And whereas, although originating in the United States, quartets and choruses have performed in many different countries, bringing the message of peace, harmony, and good, good fellowship, and whereas the Federal Way Harmony Kings have called Federal Way home for over 50 years, with the Jet City's Sweet Adeline Chorus and the Midday Melody Men having joined them in the community. And whereas these choruses and quartets have often been heard performing at civic functions in the area and frequently bring joy with their singing to many elderly and infirmed in nursing homes and adult care centers, providing entertainment to young and old alike. And whereas the Federal Way Harmony Kings, together with the Bellevue Northwest Sound Barbership Cor Barbershop Choruses, are sponsoring the Western Washington Barbershop Quartet and Chorus Competition in Federal Way on May 3rd and 4th, 2013. Now therefore, we the undersigned Mayor and City Council of the City of Federal Way do hereby proclaim May 3rd and 4th as Barbershop Harmony Days in Federal Way and encourage all residents to join in the celebration of this wonderful art form. We'd like to thank you very much for this, and right now we'll sing the song for you that we sing every night at our rehearsal on Tuesday nights, which all you gentlemen are welcome, and uh, at St. Luke's uh, Lutheran Church. <coughs> so much for coming that was just terrific it really means a lot to all of us to have that that type of art presentation here tonight so thank you 
this, uh, I guess we're, I guess we're Councilor, Council Member Honda's evening tonight. So we're moving now to certificates of appointment for the Diversity Commission and the Human Services Commission. All right. Um, I would like to ask Diversity Commissioner Cheryl Carino Burr and Alternate Jim Miranda and Human Services Commissioner Jack Stanford to come to the podium. I will read the certificates of appointment to the Diversity Commission and the Human Services Commission and present them at the podium. I know Jack's here and I know Mr. Miranda's here. Yeah, I'm going to say. <laughs> <laughs> You can almost, well, we'll talk about that. You Jack. can almost hear the mic turn off, together. can't you? <laughs> and I'm not. <laughs> yes, you are. Certificate of appointment. In accordance with Ordinance 06 531, <coughs> the City of Federal Way Mayor and City Council certifies Cheryl Karina Burr and James Miranda um, to, to be appointed to serve as members of the Federal Way Diversity Commission for a term to expire May 31st of 2013, dated this 16th day of April of 2013. It's signed by the council and the mayor. And a certificate of appointment in accordance with ordinance 96-281, the City of Federal Way Mayor and City Council certifies Jack Stanford is hereby appointed to serve as a voting member of the Federal Way Human Services Commission for a term to expire January 31st of 2016, dated this 16th day of April, 2013, signed by our mayor and the city council. just like to thank the council for this this is uh, this is the first starting we've talked a, a lot and they know that I'm wanting to embark on a political career and this is the first step and I thank you for giving me this opportunity not only to serve you but also to serve the city of federal way I thank you very much thank you Jack <laughs> thank you very much mayor council I really appreciate the opportunity to serve the city and and the community. We have a big crowd tonight. I don't know if the camera can go out there, but most of these people are here to welcome the two of us to. <laughs> and I'm not going to sing, but uh, really, I'm looking forward to serving, serving the city and the community as I have done, and just a real honor and real enjoyment to be part of it. So thank you very much. Thank you, Jack. That's a tough act to follow, isn't it? Uh, tonight at 6.30, as many of you know, we held a reception in the back of the room to recognize and honor our city volunteer commissioners, committee members, and board members who spend so much time on behalf of our community on, in very important roles. Um, Councilmember Honda is going to make a few remarks again as we continue the Councilmember Honda show tonight. All and right. then there's going to be a brief presentation. Thank you. I am really pleased that tonight we're recognizing and honoring the work of an extraordinary group of volunteers, the members of the city's commissions, committees, and boards. These citizens help inform and improve policy making on a wide range of issues and help the city government better connect with and serve the community. Uh, before I became a council member, I served on the Arts Commission and the Diversity Commission, and I know firsthand the commitment that these volunteers make and the amount of time that they serve. And it is a lot of time to be on a commission. Uh, different commissions do different things, but the one thing that all commissioners do is put a lot of time into their volunteer work. Your participation makes Federal Way City Government more effective and makes our community a better place to live, work, and play. We're going to have a brief presentation, and I'd like to ask commission members who are here tonight to come up in front of the dais when your commission is mentioned and stay there until after the presentation and we will take a, another photo with the mayor and the council.
service to the public. Never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, that's the only thing that ever has. Margaret Mead. The Arts Commission. The Arts Commission advises the mayor and the city council on all areas of the arts and cultural activities, including the fine arts, literary, performing, and visual arts. And I know we have art commissioners who are coming up. This is the only commission that meets in the morning. So if you've ever wanted to serve on a, on a commission and you can't make evening meetings, this commission meets the first Thursday of the month at 7.30 in the morning. The Civil Service Commission. The Civil Service Commission is an independent body that oversees the recruitment and selection of employees within the city's police department. The Diversity Commission. The Diversity Commission advises the mayor and the city council on policy matters involving the community's cultural and ethnic richness. The Ethics Board. The Ethics Board issues advisory opinions on sections of the adopted Code of Ethics and investigates and reports on specific complaints lodged against any elected city official. The Human Services Commission. The Human Services Commission advises the mayor and the city council concerning human services planning and funding. Your first official job. The Independent Salary Commission. The Independent Salary Commission reviews and establishes the salaries of the mayor and the council members. The Loan Review Advisory Committee. This is our newest committee. The Loan Review Advisory Committee makes funding recommendations to the mayor and the city council regarding community development block grant loan applications. The Lodging Tax Advisory Committee. The Lodging Tax Advisory Committee advises the Mayor and City Council on the allocation of lodging tax revenue for programs and activities that will encourage tourism in federal way. The North Lake Management District Advisory Committee. This committee advises the Mayor and City Council regarding implementation of ongoing programs designed to improve North Lake's health. The members engage in hands-on activities and outreach including public education and awareness. The Parks and Rec Recreation Commission. I know we have some of you guys here too. The Parks and Recreation Commission advises the mayor and the city council and staff on matters involving acquisition, development, and operational impacts of Parks and Recreation Department facilities and programs. The Planning Commission. The Planning Commission advises the Mayor and City Council regarding land use policies, including the Federal Way Comprehensive Plan and Development Regulations. The Steel Lake Management District Advisory Committee. This committee advises the Mayor and City Council regarding implementation of ongoing programs designed to improve Steel Lake's health. The members actively engage in activities which include providing community public education and awareness. The Youth Commission. The Youth Commission advises the Mayor, City Council, other City Boards and Commissions, and the City staff on issues of importance to our youth in federal way. 
We want to thank you for your time, your hard work, and your dedication to the City of Federal Way. We appreciate all the time that you put into your work and the service that you give to our citizens. Thank you. Or are we all set on the picture front? Uh, Chris, do you want to? No? We're good? I think we're fine. Okay. Anyway. We just have a picture of you. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> it's downstairs. Yeah, it's downstairs. Oh. <laughs> Thank you very much. It's hard to keep up, isn't it? <laughs> yes. As you can see, that is just a few of the wonderful people in our community who spend a great deal of time. Uh, meeting a wide range of responsibilities both in terms of guidance and direction and as far as a very important issue so thank you all uh, and then also uh, because if you don't eat all the cake and cookies back there uh, we'll have to take it down to the police and so please help yourself uh. our next uh, our next uh, portion of our agenda has to do with emerging issues, and there are two tonight. First, a brief legislative update, and then a very important issue regarding our police department. In fact, I'm going to start, since Chief Wilson is here, as well as other members of the department, um, with the police department. Uh, this past Saturday, the Federal Way Lions hosted the annual Helen Keller Basketball Challenge, some might say a grudge match. Um, between the Federal Way Police Department and King County, South King County Fire and Rescue. I'm happy to say, and I know the council was there also watching, I'm happy to say that our police department's hoopsters emerged victorious in a 51 to 33 game that was not as close as the score indicated. <laughs> There is historically a friendly rivalry between the police department and our firefighters in various competitions, and I would mention the cooking, but they won. So we won't mention the fact that the fire department won the cooking. And it would be easy enough to brag about the win, but I'll leave that to Chief Wilson. Instead, note that this was all for a wonderful cause, raising funds for the Federal Way Lions Foundation for sight and hearing, and all the competitors are to be congratulated. Dick, I know you're here. To other members of the Lions, as well as the Kiwanis, thank you all for a wonderful event. Just, just a great time was had by so many, and we'll look forward to next year when we hope the score will even be more than 51 to 33. That's one of the nice things about being the mayor is when I was a state representative, I had to root for both teams. Now, it's a lot easier to vote to root for the police department. So again, Brian, thank you, and all the rest of the members of the department. It was really a good time, as well as the Lions and Kiwanis. In regards to proceedings in Olympia last night, the Senate unanimously passed 47 with one absence legislation to preserve the city's ability to invest lodging tax revenues to support major tourism events such as the U.S. Olympic dive trials. Um, needless to say, this is one of the city's priority issues uh, this session, as this bill is critical to tourism and our local economy. We anticipate the changes made in the Senate will be confirmed by the House and will report back to the Council on the progress when that occurs. In addition, the Senate and the House have each released their operating capital budgets, and while it's still early in the process, there are a couple of items that, to note. The first is the proposed Performing Arts and Conference Center is slated for $2 million in the House capital budget, a very, very strong endorsement by the House because it was the second highest grant amount in the entire budget, um, an indication, I believe, of the project's qualities, as well as Representative Freeman's hard work on the city's behalf. On a related project, the $1.75 million for the Critical Capacity Project, Lake Haven's downtown sewer upgrades, is contained in both the House and the Senate budgets. And so that's very, very good. There's still a long ways to go in the session, and we may even see a special session to finish the budget. But at least on the major initiatives, as far as the city is concerned, metal theft, as well as the budget, as well as other issues, um, we are making uh, very, very good progress on the city's legislative priorities. Finally, before we move to citizen comment, I'd like to note that the photos that you've been seeing, in fact, that's a very good example, on the presentation screen was taken Friday at the West Highlands Wetlands uh, during a salmon release at environmental science fair involving more than 300 of our students from the Federal Waste Public School District. 
Council Members Burridge, Honda, Noble Guilford, and I were there. And my personal thanks, and I know I thank on behalf of the Council to Holly Shilley and the Surface Water Management staff, as well as uh, staff members from the school district who helped put on an outstanding uh, event. And you could see it was an outstanding event just by the looks in the young students' eyes, the fact that they were actually able to have a hands-on opportunity to put the fish in the water and in three years, hopefully they'll be back and we'll be able to watch them uh, at the headwaters of the Hyalopus Creek. And so uh, representatives from both King 5 as well as KCPQ were there and gave the students a chance as well as the Federal Way Mirror also had a photo. So if you're interested in some of the pictures of the kids that were there and uh, participating uh, on the Federal Way Mirror website, there's some great pictures of the event. Uh, we're going to have a more detailed presentation, I believe, uh, in the next couple of meetings from the Surface Water Management. So my thanks again to Holly and the crew. It was really, really fun to watch. Moving now to citizen comment. As many of you know, citizen comment provides the citizens an opportunity to comment on issues that may or may not be on the agenda. Council rules of procedure provide that the remarks should be addressed to the council as a whole and not to or about an individual. If you filled out a pink form and handed it to the city clerk, I'll call your name for you to come to the podium to speak. Uh, please limit your comments to three minutes, except where you're speaking on behalf of a group, and then it's five minutes. The green light on the podium indicates that the time has begun for your comments. The yellow light indicates that you have 30 seconds, and the red light indicates that you have used the entire three minutes. Please stop when the red light and alarm come on. Alarm. I have no idea what that'll sound like. So we'll find out, I guess. Um, the first person to uh, wish to speak is Nancy Combs. Following Nancy uh, will be Roy Park and Nathan Garcia. So Nancy. Council, Mayor, and Public. I used to come all the time. I enjoyed this council. Not anymore. We don't come and we don't want to. I will not come anymore. You have ruined my life. I'll tell you what you've done to me. And you've taken our street now. And you come up and put big signs and say, oh, we're going to add 50 feet, uh, 500 feet to the road so we can come in your yard and do what we damn well please. No, that is horrible. I have lived there for 50 and 60 years and so has Jim Frary next door. He's 92. And we have to put up with all of you. You're going to fill in our street? No, it's not a freeway and that's what they're trying to use it as. Just like Steel Leak Park. Somebody stop that, thank God, and I hope they have the brains to stop this. I have an appointment Thursday, and if they, they say, oh, don't block your driveway, don't drop your garage, too bad. Well, I'll tell you, if you stop my appointment, you'll never hear the end of it. I have worked hard in that city. I mow the neighbor's lawn. I do everything to make it nice. Five and six o'clock in the morning, there they are, coming up the street with lights and motors. I have things across my window, blinds, everything, trying to keep out that noise and that. But nope, you don't do a dang thing. They can just turn right and they can come up as a freeway. Well, it's time that it was stopped. And all those cars, all the ones that they're going to fill in our driveways, and they're, no. We're very happy the way we were. My kids knew how to walk to school, and the kids of today walk. Uh, Lakota, they, they're wonderful. They know how to walk. They don't need more street because they don't know how to walk. What the heck is going on in this city? It's bad. This city is bad, and I'm not going to back off from saying it. All my relatives, my kids that graduated here said they'd never come back here, ever, and their friends won't either. What's going on here is sad. Now, you've got to stop it and leave us alone. We enjoy our yard. We keep care of it. You don't live there. That's, I know where you live. And that, you're not letting us 
live our lives. So we don't need you up there anymore. You can just go the way wherever it is, but not up in front of us. We don't want you. If you can't help us with our lives and you're taken away every minute, I know where you shop, I know where you live, I know everything. And you've got to stop it and leave us alone instead of putting 500 more feet into our front yards. Thank, thank you for Ms. Collins. Yeah, well, you know by what way I of mean, too. By way of background, we are currently doing an asphalt overlay program on 21st Avenue near Adelaide. Uh, as many of you know, asphalt overlay has been a major commitment of our community to ensure that our roads do not deteriorate. That does include a five-foot widening on one side, uh, which will be used uh, where there's now a path for young men and women to be able to walk to Adelaide, as well as a, a mounted kind of uh, uh, divider, very much like you see near Olympic View Elementary, as, also, as well as Marine Hills, to provide a a border for safety for the young men and women who do walk to Adelaide down that pathway. Now, Mr. Park, <coughs> then Mr. Garcia, and then Therese you Moore. Five, five minutes, you do, you do, Mr. Park. Thank you. Good evening, uh, Mayor, members of the City Council, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Roy Park. I have been speaking about I am speaking about project number 2451 the Hyla Basin Plan and the result of which was an eminent domain action against me and my neighbors. My problem with the city of Federal Way started 17 and a half years ago. Since then I have spent thousands of dollars to fight for my rights, those of my neighbors, and for all the citizens of Federal Way. I am speaking and will continue to speak because false information were used and false statements were made by Federal Way employees. For 11 and a half years now, I've been making very specific charges of intent and activity by our Director of Public Works. These charges have expanded to others within the city uh, government. Mr. Park, I would appreciate it as I indicated in the beginning of our direction that we not indicate any specific individual. Thank you. Okay. But what about the police chief? I think that... Uh, one specific individual is one specific individual, and another specific individual is another specific individual. Well, then how do you and talk so about things that have been done with the city when, you know, the, uh, I've made these charges in here, uh, and without the before, and there's nothing that's ever been said about mentioning a person's position. A person's name, yes. A person's position, no. The other people have mentioned their positions. So, you know, all I can say, Mayor, and I'll just get down the elect, uh, elected mayor. Let's see. Yeah, and since I can't finish my speech by not using the police chief's name. An elected mayor has the power and authority and the obligation to forward detailed and documented charges against the city to an outside law enforcement agency for an investigation. During the council meeting on May 17, 2011, I offered to take you, mayor, and show you the geographical area in question so you could see exactly what had taken place. No response. I also called on you and you and told you that we needed to talk. Your response was condescending and dismissive. About what? In short, you have made no attempt to speak to me about the issues, about the charges that I've been making. Um, Mayor, on, you said on May 17th that you had reviewed these charges and found, quote, no wrongdoing. Without meeting with the person who made the charges and getting all the facts. This is not even logical. That is like someone being robbed and the police getting the robber's side of the story and ignoring the critical testimony of the person robbed. I'm quite assure, aware by making, making these charges, I open myself up for legal action against me. Why am I not afraid? Simple. The charges are true. I have been threatened with legal action on two separate occasions, on February 16th of 2010 and on January 18th, 2011. Okay, let's have some transparency. Bring out the facts and I'll bring out mine. We'll meet in the courtroom, all under oath. Me and everyone that's involved in this with several city officials about the corruption that I've been talking about for years. And like as, again, like I said, I've always mentioned the, the, the positions. It'd be like mention any position and any other people talk about positions of people in here. I mentioned the police chiefs and other people's name up here and there's nothing said. You do about me. But like I said, Mayor, I've made these charges and you never once have tried to even speak to me about what the charges are, but yet you made your decision that there was nothing going on. 
So I think that you, what you ought to do is look at both sides before you make a decision about what's really going on. And like I said, this has never been investigated by nobody. It was sent over to the FBI. Why? Because the FBI was the only place that, that my charges could be forwarded on to where the statute of limitations was up. After that, it was forwarded on to the King County Prosecutor. The King County Prosecutor does not investigate. They review. Nobody has seen my documents. Only what the police, only what was presented to them, handed them from the city of Federal Way, not from me. And you have a you have an obligation to look into my charges, Mayor, and see what I have to say before you say there's no wrongdoing. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Park. As I started this meeting, uh, I was reminded at age 63 that my memory is not as good as it used to be and that vitamin D probably wouldn't care about the finish line. However, I did remember, Mr. Park, that in fact I offered to have you meet in my office and then never heard another word from you. By way of background for those who may be new to this issue, um, being the elected mayor certainly requires accountability of the citizens. At the same time, being the elected mayor status does not change the facts. In 1988, King County approved the preliminary Pratt and ultimate location of a real regional stormwater and surface water retention facility on 356th. The allegations of fraud and perjury by city officials and city staff have been raised in three separate, three separate King County Superior Court cases. Judges have been determined there is no evidence of wrongdoing. The city did not condemn Mr. Park's property because he sold it. On May 6, 2008, Mr. Park, Patricia Owen, Randy Neighbor, and Bernard Mottershead met with Chief Wilson and Commander Neal for an hour to discuss and produce documents to support allegations of criminal misconduct. The city prosecutor reviewed the information on multiple occasions at the request of police chiefs, the Federal Bureau of Investigations, King County Prosecutor, and the Attorney General all opined that there is no evidence in this particular instance of fraud or perjury. While I appreciate the fact that Mr. Park continues to disagree with the decisions made by judges, prosecutors, as well as outside engineering experts. I do support, as the elected mayor, the responsiveness, the thoroughness, and the actions taken by the staff in this matter. Mr. Garcia, then Therese Moore, and then Flora Simpson. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen of the committee. My name is Nathan Garcia. I am here before everybody because I have taken every avenue necessary in order to have this dealt with. I had a claim against the city of Federal Way for damages done to my vehicle by road of 348th in between the road of 6th Avenue South, 348th. I was first told after two weeks that my claim had been denied because it was unknown and that it was not notified by the city that there was any report for it to be repaired. That was the initial decision of why my claim was denied. I took it under my own ability to go and get a preliminary report and statement from public records, which therefore shows that, let me pull out the sheet here on my preliminary public records request, saying for field use only that frame and grate are lower than the road grade, edges are angled. That is not true. I have photos of evidentiary facts against that. Evidently, this structure is inspected in December 2012. I was initially denied my claim because they said that it was not known about. This was on the 18th of March of 2013. It says here it was inspected in December 2012. No threat of catastrophic failure, so I understand that the manhole was not going to fall through the hole, and that's understandable. Though, it caused $2,500 in damage to my vehicle, and as a taxpayer of the city and this country, to keep these roads and everything sustained and kept in a good condition, to have $2,500 in damage done to my vehicle, including labor, of course, and for it to say here that it was placed on the rebuild list and fixed, broken around the frame to be repaired when weather permits as of December 2012. There has been plenty of times between now and then where the weather has permitted for it to be repaired, and I find it very, very frustrating that the fact that at first it was denied because it was unknown, and then as soon as I find my preliminary report and I file my appeal, then they go about saying that there was no weather permitted in order to have it repaired. Thus, after I had made my claim, it was repaired less than a week later. So I'm here before this committee as a taxpayer for the roads and everything else, that I am trying to get my car repaired. 
I lost my career in California. I was supposed to have moved down there two weeks ago. I am still here. I had to find a place to live, costing me $3,500 at my age of 24 years old. That is a very high amount of money. So unfortunately, now I'm stuck here in Federal Way, which I have a job and warehouse. It's great. I have a place to stay. That's great. But unfortunately, I lost my career. So therefore, all I'm trying to ask, and I'm trying to deal with this in a very civil manner, is to have my car repaired and be treated with such respect that of everybody else in this city and country that it be taken care of. I, it is outrageous, the fact that I have had to go through this many avenues and have to report right here in front of you guys in order to have this dealt with. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Garcia. Ms. Richardson? Um, yes, Council, um, we, the city did receive the claim for damages. As our usual practice, we investigated the claim. Uh, and we discovered that through documentation that uh, staff noted that there was a surface water manhole and immediate uh, surrounding area were below grade by an inch and three quarters. Um, because of that, um, it was put on the list to repair as weather permitted. The repair, as you know, on 348th would require a lane closure as well, and as soon as possible it was repaired, as Mr. Uh, Garcia indicated, on March 27th. So based on that, uh, the claim has been denied. Thank you, Mr. Garcia, for coming in. I will personally talk to the, process, or the, the city attorney and follow up on this as well. Therese? Thank you and hello, um, Mayor and council members. As you know, from time to time, I appear before the council to make sure that in my role as the district's family and community partnership director, that I am um, showing as much transparency and accountability in regards to what the department does, how we do it, and what's going on in the district, not just with my department, but with our families and community engagement activities throughout all of our community. So. Within the five minutes that I have, I am going to let you hear from two of the students that one of our teachers and our principal have provided for us so that you don't have to just listen to the adults. You can actually hear from um, two of our wonderful children. I'm also going to uh, provide for you, and it will be handed to you by our students, a booklet that we were able to create that's called Partnership 101, and because of the work that our district has done um, nationally, we've been acknowledged and recognized because we're really serious about engaging families and having partnerships with community members. Because of this, the Gates Foundation, as you know, um, because of my last presentation, has provided this department $100,000 to do more of what we've already done without um, just using district money. So they gave us some extra money to do above and beyond what we were already doing. And they didn't say, do something new. They said, keep doing what you're doing. So with their money, we created these booklets in four languages. And I am going to ask my assistants to provide one to each council member, if that's OK, and the mayor. Could you pass those out and share them? Let him have some. Thank you. And as they hand those out, I am also going to share with you that we have a Parent Leadership Institute through the Federal Way School District. And in the booklet, you'll notice on the inside cover, we've explained that the Parent Leadership Institute is our way of allowing parents to be more informed, prepared, and involved by not just coming to meetings and events, but also by having an opportunity to see videos about how they can help their kids succeed in school online and to partner with each other to get information about supporting their students' academic success. So before I go on any further, I want to um, close by sharing with you that our district is tied with the Seattle School District, which has 40,000 students. We have 22,000. We're tied with that district in the number of parents registered for a regional parent forum that's called Strengthening Families and Community Connections Roadmap Parent Forum. And the reason why I mention that to you is because of the seven districts, South Seattle, Auburn, Kent, Highline, Federal Way, Tequila, Auburn. Um, we find that it's really interesting that we're one of the smaller districts, but we are 
tied with the largest district in having parents that are interested in participating in, finding out more information, being prepared, and being involved in helping their kids succeed. So we know as a department and as a district and a community that even if we don't see parents at the school, parents do want to be involved. They do want to help their kids succeed, and we just have to remove obstacles and provide support for that to happen. So now I will ask Marin Miller, the principal of Twin Lakes, and Jennifer Martin to introduce our two students that are going to share with you a little bit about who we are today and thank Mayor Priest for attending. And my name is Mary Miller. I'm the principal of Twin Lakes Elementary. I just wanted to come before the mayor and the council and the city here and thank you for your involvement in our Who Are We Day. In a second we'll hear from the kids but each of you, um, many of you came out to our school and got actively involved talking to our students and you made a difference. You shared your stories with them and those stories, the kids took them home and they went back to their families and they shared your stories and they learned from them. And that, that parent involvement and that community involvement is making a difference in our school. So we thank the mayor and Therese Moore for helping us put this on, but let's hear from the students. So first I'll introduce um, Jeffrey Martin, our instructional coach. Hi, thank you for your, your commitment to our community and to our students and schools. Um, I have two exceptional students to introduce you to. Um, they truly are a reflection of our motto, We Achieve Together. We have Emma Wadley of Ms. Tomervik's fourth grade classroom and Jean Cho of Ms. Uh, John's second and third grade gate class. So I'll let you hear from them. I want to thank the mayor for coming to our school for our Who Are We Day. I think it was important that he came to our school for one, we had a lot of fun with him, and for second, it was important for the younger kids to learn about him and learn what he does. Thank you. The reason why Who Are We Day is so important is because we can learn from other people and their experiences of their lives. And what I learned is that think positive during a negative situation and always think positive. Thank you. So thank you very much. <laughs> did the kids do great? They did. Yeah. Thank you all. <laughs> Therese, as well as so many others, I'd like to thank you for your leadership. Uh, our school district is committed to all means all when it comes to giving young men and women the opportunity for success and the, the event at Twin Lakes was another example of providing that foundation. So thank you all. Uh, it's also a great lesson that we as the city follow and that is all means all when it comes to providing the quality services that are necessary, whether it's parks, whether it's roads, whether it's public safety. So. Thank you again for coming. Thank you all, and Teresa. Yeah, I'm sorry. Can I give you the um, URL to sign up for the roadmap project if you're a parent out in the audience, so that we can beat Seattle? <laughs> Absolutely, whatever you'd like, Teresa. Okay, really quickly, if you go to the district's website, www.fwps.org, you'll see on the um, initial page, on the home page, maybe the third line. It says roadmap parent forum, and right now. Um, if we're not tied, we might, all, might be losing our lead because Seattle did a big, um, they, they wanted to beat us. But anyway, we believe we have more parents that are interested in being involved. And it's free, free lunch, um, free crafts and activities for kids. So far, there are 500 people registered, and I'd like for our district to um, have the most parents that attend. It's on Saturday, April 20th, and we have lots of staff members that are going um, even though it's a non-work day and it's a weekend, we have lots of staff members that are going. So I would ask that you would please register, and not just register just to give us a higher number, but register if you're going. To, uh, Therese, is that also on the Federal Way School District website where the signing can be for yes. those of us who have yes, memory have issues, which seems to be a recurring theme here today in terms yeah. of remembering a website would not be very good for me. So anyway, it is on the website so that we can find it. Yes. All right, thank you. Moving now to Flora Simpson then Peg Altman, and then Mike Nugent. And it's happy birthday, right? Yes. <laughs> so there you go. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I'm from the community of Belmore Park. I wish to thank the mayor, the deputy mayor, and the council members for listening to our concerns. 
I've lived in Federal Way for 17 years in Belmore Park, and I hope to be able to stay there the rest of my life. <laughs> so this is regarding the rezoning, which I'm sure you're all aware. Thank Great. you so much. Thank you for coming, Flora. Uh, Peg, Mike Nugent, and then Renee Marshall. Thank you for letting us come and talk to you today. Um, I'm Peg Altman, and my husband and I are residents of Belmore Park. <clears throat> I wanted you all to know that I am speaking for the 1,100 people or voters who live in the six mobile home parks in Federal Way. We moved to Federal Way in 1985. We moved here because we found a house we could afford. I only knew two people here, Mary Ann and Sam Mitchell. I met Mary Ann in the mid 70s when I took a job at the King County <coughs> Advocates for Retarded Citizens. And some of you may not know that Mary Ann is sometimes referred to as the mother of Federal Way. <laughs> Um, she introduced me to her community, one in which she and Sam both loved. We went about our lives, met more people. Our daughters went to Lakota and Decatur. The town, whose only original attraction was the price of a house, became our home. Time flew by. Fast forward to today. As I said in my letter to all of you, which you all read, right? <laughs> <coughs> now we needed a different kind of community. We have found that in Belmore Park Golf and Country Club. Mary Ann and Sam are gone now, but what she taught me, perseverance and commitment to our community, is alive in me and many more people. Today we are here to ask you to adopt a specific zoning district for mobile manufactured home parks and to elevate it to a high priority in the 2013 work plan. We moved to Belmore to ease into our retirement years. 63, Skip. We intended to continue being committed to Federal Way. Will you be committed to us? Thank you. Thank you very much, Peg, and thank you for your kind words about Marianne and Sam Mitchell. Obviously, Marianne Mitchell was a tremendous leader in our community and was, in fact, the mother of Federal Way. And we all miss her. We did, however, name a bridge across the freeway for her. So when you when you go on 320 at the cross to the unincorporated area, you're, you're going across the Marianne Mitchell Bridge. So, Mr. Nugent, then Renee Marshall. And then, is it Kimes? I'm going to, is Judy Kimes, is that? Yeah. Judy, great. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Mayor and uh, council members. Uh, I'm a resident as well at Belmore Park. And uh, we're promoting the process of uh, mobile home park zoning at, at our park as well as 11 other parks in the city of Federal Way. And that's about 1,100 residents in, uh, in this area. And uh, what we're concerned, why we're con promoting this is that uh, we are owners in, in these parks. We are owners as well as renters. We rent the property, but we own our homes. The problem is that if, uh, if the owner of the land decides to sell the property, we have one year to relocate or move our homes out of that area. And that's really not an option for any of us because there's nowhere to go for primary thing. And uh, there's no, you just can't move. Our homes actually are not considered mobile homes anymore. As a result, uh, the, uh, there was a federal uh, act in 1974 that uh, was the Mobile Home Safety Act, uh, and uh, they made the mobile homes permanent since we are attached to water, sewer, and utilities. Then they are considered a permanent for a lifetime now. But the problem is, if the owners sell the park, we're in real trouble because uh, where we cannot move the homes uh, to or relocate very well. And so what we're promoting, there's a process that has 
gone on down in the city of Tumwater uh, for 10 parks down there, the, own, the uh, mobile home homeowners uh, went through this process already that we're promoting and has passed and went through the Ninth, the ninth Circuit Court down there. And uh, uh, they found out uh, through that court that uh, that uh, the rule, the, uh, let me read it here. Uh, the Ninth Circuit Court, U.S. Court of Appeals, has ruled that the mobile home park zones are constitutional under both the state and federal constitutions. Oh, that's all right. Anyway, uh, we would like your support in uh, having that zoning uh, change to what the existing park is. It's not, it's not that zoning. And so that just kind of gives us a little space that if they wanted to sell it, it would continue as a mobile home park. Thank you very much. Mike, thank you very much. Renee, <coughs> then Judy, and then Dan Barrett. Ready? Um, hi. Uh, thank you very much, Mayor and, and uh, City Council members. Um, my name is Renee Marshall. I'm a, I'm a new resident to Federal Way, I, but I'm a native of Washington. Uh, my mother, uh, we moved my mother to Belmore Park um, about five years ago, so she's she's been there for a few years. I'm a I'm a new resident of there, uh, of the community, um, and the reason I'm here today is again to to bring more awareness and bring the uh, priority of the mobile home park zoning up to a higher priority so it gets addressed this year, and the, and the reason I ask of that is that. You know our our owner, Mr. Hines, terrific young you know young gentleman in his mid 70s. He's aging, and he's also he also is um, has been in ill health. Okay, so he owns 20 other parks around the country. He's very dedicated to his communities, um, but because the zoning is is so we're so vulnerable because of the zoning being a um, a. It, because it's it's really flexible and if his heirs decide that they want to sell it to a developer that wants to change the, the landscape then they you know then we are really stuck as uh, Mike uh, mentioned earlier is is we have you know I'm in an older home I it's been completely remodeled it's a beautiful little place right on the golf course great place to, to spend because I'm trying to prepare for my retirement years and you know it's it's very difficult with without a lot of funds so I, I want to say that the Belmore Park is is a great safe community it's a community that we we call home it's it's neighbors I don't know if you guys remember the old neighborhoods where you didn't have to lock your doors we have you know we have a community uh, count or a uh, security guards on hand everybody knows everybody the, the crime rate if you talk with your police officers is is low to, to basically nothing there because we self-police a lot of times but it's a it's a great community to live in and I want to make sure that we can continue to live there and, and grow old there um, let's see the the demographics of the community so you get an idea of who these folks are is there the average age is about 68 to 70 um, we have almost I think we had I asked the um, the manager today I think we have about 580 uh, residents there many are in our fixed incomes so for them to start over is really it's just not an option so we really need to elevate this up so I um, as Mike mentioned there's there's already some legislation in place and some we've already um, you know the res the um, I guess the amount of resources it's going to take to be able to put this into place is really minimal because it's already been taking place in other parts of the state. So, um, if you need any additional information, I, I gave you my email as well as my phone number. So please give us a call if you need anything. But thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much for coming in, Judy and Dan, and then Tracy Hills. Thank you for letting me speak. I'm Judy Kimes. I've lived at Belmore Park about seven years. Prior to that, I lived 34 years in Kent. So I've been, uh, and prior to that, I was born and raised in Seattle. So Washington means a lot to me. Um, I basically wanted to share that other cities have adopted mobile home park zoning ordinances. So why not do it in fed away for Belmore Park? So we would appreciate it if you would raise our request to a higher priority as soon as possible 
and my home residence, who I love very much, of Belmore Park, Mobile Home Park, and Federal Way, thank you so much for listening to our pleas. Thank you. Thank you, Judy. Dan, then Tracy, and then Mr. Hadef. Mayor, Council Member, thank you for allowing uh, a visitor to your city the privilege of speaking with, with you. Uh, my name is Dan Barrett. I'm the president of the Association of Manufactured Homeowners, a Washington association, uh, as its name implies, representing the homeownership interest of manufactured homeowners in the state of Washington, uh, roughly 70,000 different residents across the state in about uh, 1,400 parks. Um, I'm a resident of the city of Kent, like the previous speaker was previously, and we do enjoy in the city of Kent a mobile home park zoning cl uh, classification. Uh, it's very reassuring to us as residents in the city of Kent that we have that. The state of Washington statutes, RCW 5920, provides that if a park is going to close, that all residents have a 12-month eviction notice given to them prior to closure of the park. This gives everybody about a year to prepare for, for moving. The average cost of moving a manufactured or mobile home in the state of Washington, if you can find a place to put it, and you have to get the uh, uh, amenities, you have to get a, a, a shed, sidewalks, driveways, porches, uh, and such installed is about $25,000. That equates to more than $2,000 a month that a resident has to save. Most seniors and families living in these communities do not have the resources to do that. Their only option their only option is to try and sell it to somebody who does have the resources, which greatly reduces the value of the home, or simply walk away. And unfortunately, the history has been when these uh, events occur is that most residents walk away. The only enrichment that is achieved by that is by the park owners. Through abandonment, they acquire the mobile home. I would ask that as a leader of the uh, state association, I'll be granted five minutes. I still have a few more comments to make. Well, I'd love to give you that exception, but then other people, unfortunately, would. Okay. The, does the council have a problem with an extra two minutes since? I don't have a problem. The deputy mayor has blessed the next two minutes. So okay, there you thank go. you very much. <laughs> thank you. Okay, so um, my, my, my career was in banking. There you have, a share, you have shareholders who own a bank. They offer enticements to the public to make an investment in their bank. Bring your deposits to us, borrow money from us so you can buy things. And there are laws in place to protect those depositors and protect those in, investors in that in, in investment. When we move into a park, a partnership is formed with the park owner. We have to invest, we have to purchase a home in order to live there. We're asking for the same type of protection. Rezoning will not prohibit park owners from selling their parks or from converting their use. But rezoning does provide that extra layer of time to allow the homeowners to respond and react to that situation. The Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals has upheld and cleared the way for these zoning ordinances in the city of Tumwater de decision. Uh, Marysville, uh, the city of Tumwater, of course, and the city of Linwood are now moving forward all with their zoning ordinances. Kent already had it in, in place, and we do in, in enjoy it. So I just ask that you move to a higher priority to get this issue settled uh, in the city of Fed Federal Way. And Mayor, lastly, I'd like to say if you have any difficulty
dealing with the extra cake in the back of the room, I will be happy to take it back to Mayor Cook and President Higgins of the Kent City Council if you... <laughs> as, I as I suggested, without prejudicing your approach, uh, it's Suzette versus the Police Department. I think the Council would probably err on the side of our Police Department. So. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much for coming in, uh, Dan. We really appreciate it. Uh, Tracy Hills, then uh, Jack L. Howden. Hello, Mr. Mayor. I'd also, I'd also like to welcome the two uh, council members. And um, what I'd like to talk about is the lights that's off of um, where the apartment of licensing is, all the way back to where my apartments are. The lights have been off for about a month and a half, and I'd like to get them fixed or find out why they're off. Second issue was about the arts thing that you guys want to have built. I don't think it's a good idea. I'm opposing. I oppose that, and I want to know where you guys were planning to put that. And then. Uh, the other question was about the old bus barn, if you guys wanted to buy that and move all your guys' trucks from there, from the old fire station to the old bus barn where the school district. That's all I have to say. Thank you very much for coming in, Tracy. I believe the, Mr. Tracy lives at 19th Place South. I believe we're looking into that. That was a metal theft issue, um, which was identified by uh, a person who came in, Tracy, into my office. Uh, we referred it to the Public Works Department, and in fact, there have been significant metal theft uh, occurring there, which turned the lights out. And I'm not sure, uh, Mr. Roll, what the timetable or Mr. Perez, but we are in fact uh, working on it as we speak. Is there, Go ahead. Mr. Mayor, is there an interplay with, there with uh, PSE and whether they replace it versus us replace it? it? It would be the city's responsibility. And this is, uh, this is fairly recent in regard to metal theft? It's, it's another location in which we've encountered metal theft. So it involves the street lights, uh, the new string of LED, LED street lights, actually, one of our first sets in. So uh, we made this work order at King County. We anticipate it being fixed in the next two or three weeks. It is, uh, its location is near the licensing center. We're talking about the street that runs kind of um, on the south end of the mall and then heads down towards the licensing center. So. That has been identified and an order has been put in. We do use King County to do uh, repairs for those type of uh, situations. But it's also a reminder why, and thanks to Deputy Mayor Farrell and others, uh, the metal theft has been a priority uh, as far as our legislative um, initiative is concerned. And uh, it is just another example. Um, in fact, I heard that uh, Senator Eide once again uh, faced a challenge just this week. So it's. Metal theft is something we are yeah. at her, at her, at her uh, office, so it's a, a major challenge. Um, Mr. Al, Al, Al had deaf. Al had deaf. Sorry, I I actually got it right the first three times, but I failed in the last one. So we're we're glad you're here. Well, thank you. It, it, I'll tell you what. Mr. Alhadif, since I've messed up your name about nine times, we actually are going to have a hearing specifically on this issue. And so if you would wait for just a moment. Yes. Uh, I'm sorry, we're going to get to that in the agenda. Okay. But this is on a specific item. And so we'd like to hear your thoughts uh, specifically when that item comes forward. After staff reports, we have a better context, if that's all right with you. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, that uh, ends the citizen comment that I'm aware of. If anybody else would like to make a comment, there are pink sheets. If not, we're going to move on to the consent agenda. Um, and we will be addressing uh, the issue of uh, the mobile home uh, potential zoning uh, later as we talk about the 2013 work plan for the Planning Commission. And at that time, um, staff will provide a, a, uh, a timetable in terms of what a number of initiatives are identified and exactly the process in terms of how we go forward on that so moving to the consent agenda there are one two three four five six a lot seven eight nine <laughs> ten including the minutes for the april 2nd 2013 special regular city council meeting <clears throat> the 
<coughs> South 356th Street Regional Detention Facility, 100% design and authorization to bid. Authorization to submit the grant funding application to the WSTSC. Nautilus 12 Neighborhood Traffic Safety Project, South 305th Street, Mark Twain Elementary Safe Routes to School, Final Acceptance, 2013 Asphalt Overlay Change Order, South 320th Street at 20th Avenue South Intersection Improvements, a bid award, 21st Avenue Southwest at Southwest 336th Street Intersection Improvements, a bid award, uh, the DDD Interlocal Contract, respite, as well as the Landscape Bid Award. The items on the consent agenda, and as I said, there were a lot, have previously been reviewed by Council Committee of three members and brought before <coughs> the full Council for approval. All items are enacted by one motion. After a Council member makes a motion, there is a second. Council will have the opportunity to pull an item for discussion. I will then repeat the motion and ask for a vote of the items remaining on consent. Deputy Mayor Farrell, do you have a motion? Uh, yes, Mr. Mayor, I move <laughs> approval of items A through J. Second. Council, is there a second? Second. It has been moved and second. Is there discussion? Council is voting on items A through J. All in favor of the motion, please say aye. 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 Opposed, the motion carries. We now know, go to the, item six, the selection process of the 2013 <laughs> amendments to the Federal Way Comprehensive Plan. I will now open the public hearing to consider 2013 amendments to the City of Federal Ways Comprehensive Plan under Federal Ways City Revised Code Section 19.80.080. Public hearing is required prior to the Council's selection of proposed amendments for further consideration. The purpose of this hearing is to accept public comments as to which, if any, of the proposed plan amendments should receive additional review. In terms of the hearing procedure, the public hearing will be conducted in the following manner. First, Federal Way Senior Planner, Margaret Clark, will make a brief presentation of approximately 15 minutes. Second, there will be an opportunity, Mr. Alhada, for public comment. Testimony will be limited to three minutes per person. In addition to public testimony, any interested person may participate in this public hearing by submitting written comments for our consideration. And third, the City Council will then have the opportunity to ask questions of either the public or staff. In order to expedite this process, I'm requesting the Council hold all questions until this time. Staff will now make their presentation. Mark. Good evening, um, Mayor Priest, members of the City Council. I'm Margaret Clark with the Community and Economic Development Department. And this evening I will be given a brief presentation on the 2013 Comprehensive Plan Amendment selection process. The Federal Way Revised Code requires the City to accept requests for citizen-initiated Comprehensive Plan Amendments on an annual basis. The City received three requests for this year. The three requests were one from the Federal Way Public Schools, from Mr. the second one from Mr. Al Hadef, and the third one from Dr. Summers. So the policy question in front of you is which of the three requests for comprehensive plan amendments and rezones should move forward for further review? The City Council options are for each proposed amendment to send a request for forward for further review or to not send a request forward for further review. Since we have some new members of the council, I'd like to go through what the future steps would be. For those requests that go forward for consideration, they would be evaluated pursuant to the SEPA process as non-project actions. So owners within 300 feet would be notified. And by the way, owners within 300 feet were notified of this evening's meeting. The Planning Commission will then, will then next conduct a public hearing. Again, owners within 300 feet would be notified. And then the Planning Commission recommendation would be presented to the Land Use Transportation Committee. And then the City Council would make the final decision on the request in a public meeting. So these requests that go forward will come back to you after these steps have been completed. We do have eight selection criteria, which is in your staff report and all three requests were evaluated relative to the selection criteria and were found to comply with those criteria. So I'd like to first start with request number one, which is a request from the Federal Way Public Schools. The site is the 38.32 acre Federal Way High School site. 
The existing use, of course, is the high school. The existing designation is single family, high density residential, and the zoning is RS 9.6. The, high, the public works, uh, no, pardon me, the public schools are requesting a community business designation. The reason for this request is that the school was built back in the 50s and they are hoping to rebuild the high school to better accommodate the needs of the students. Both the single family uh, zone, which is existing, and the requested BC zone allow schools. However, the BC zoning has more flexible development standards. This request is consistent with the overall vision of the comprehensive plan, which states that a community business designation encompasses two major retail commercial areas along the SR99 corridor, which is Pacific Highway South, including the segment between South 272nd 2nd Street and approximately South 312th Street. This parcel is located within that area. Also, the, there is BC zoning to the east, to the northeast, and to the south and also across the street. The Land Use Transportation Committee recommends that a request move forward for further review. Moving on to the second request is a request from Mr. Aldehoff for a 0.93 acre site that's located just south of the Federal Way High School and it's south of 308th Street. The existing use is a church. The existing designation is professional office and the applicant is requesting a uh, designation of multifamily residential with a zoning of RM1800, which is one unit per 1800 square feet. The applicant would like the flexibility to build multifam multifamily units on this site. This request is consistent with the overall vision of the comprehensive plan, which states that the multifamily residential land use designation represents an opportunity to provide a range of housing types to accommodate anticipated residential growth. As you can see, there's multifamily zoning and multifamily development to the east, to the west, and to the further to the south. The parcel directly south of this site is also zoned professional office. The Land Use Transportation Committee recommends that this request move forward for further review. The third request is a request by Dr. Summers and Mrs. Summers for a change in designation of 1.05 acres located south of North Lake between South 337th Street, 33rd Place, and 38th Place. This is Warehouser Way to the south. The existing use is vacant and the existing designation is what's called Corporate Park 1. The requested designation is single family, high density residential with a zoning of RS 9.6, one unit per 9,600 square feet. This, uh, these parcels have a little bit of history which I'd like to explain to you. At the time of the city incorporation back in 1990, these two parcels were zoned RS 7200 under King County zoning. At that time, this, this, was, this is called East Campus and it was outside of the city. In September of 1994, the East Campus area was annexed into the city with a corporate park designation for this area. And this was pursuant to what's called a concomitant zoning agreement. The CP1 designation was intended to be used for, as corporate headquarters. However, terms of this agreement also stated that the Community and Economic Development Director could determine other compatible uses other than those listed in the zone. The director did make that finding in a March 26, 2012 correspondence that single family uses were also allowed in the corporate park zone. The Summers are requesting the RS9.6 RS zoning for certainty. Even though they received the letter, they would like the zoning to reflect single family uses. The RS9.6 zoning is compatible with adjacent uses to the east. These are all RS 9.6 zones across the street also, and there are single family houses there. The request is consistent with the overall vision of the comprehensive plan, which states that the demand for and development of single family housing is expected to continue for the foreseeable future. The Land Use Transportation Committee recommends that the request move forward for further review. So for each proposed amendment, the Council has two options. One, send a request forward for further consideration or do not send a request forward for further consideration. And that's the end of the staff presentation.
Thank you very much, Margaret. Um, Mr. Ahaladev, we'll move now to public comment. I think Margaret said anything I wanted to say. <laughs> then, um, is there anyone else who may not have signed a request who may be interested in making a comment in terms of these three particular projects and recommended uh, approaches as far as the comprehensive plan adjustments are concerned? Seeing none, um, the City Council will then have an opportunity to ask questions of the staff, and so are there any questions by the Council? I just one yes. thing, we've uh, studied this at the Land Use and Transportation Committee in quite a bit of detail, but uh, just an update on, on one here, um, on Mr. Aladef's, um request. The, um, so the recommendation here is to move forward uh, from the mayor if the owner of the parcel to the south also requests the same change. So can you tell us where we stand on that, Margaret? Right, that was the mayor's recommendation. But my understanding is that the Land Use Transportation Committee recommended that this parcel move forward on its own. Okay. I just wanted to make sure that was understood. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> Any other questions or comments? Seeing none, Council Member Selsky, do you have a motion concerning the comprehensive plan? Uh, yes, I do, Mayor Priest. I move to forward all three citizen site specific requests to the Planning Commission for further consideration. Second. It has been moved and seconded. Is there discussion? Seeing none, all in favor of the motion, please say aye. 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 Opposed? The motion carries. <laughs> Council Marcelski, do you have a motion to close the public hearing? Uh, yes, I do, Mayor Priest. I move to close the public hearing of the 2013 amendments to the Federal Way Comprehensive Plan. Is there second. a second? Second. It's been moved and seconded. Is there discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? The motion carries the public hearing to consider the 2013 amendments to the Federal Way Comprehensive Plan Amendment is now closed. Thank you very much, Margaret, for the presentation. We now move to Council Business. There are two items on the plan, Council Business. One is the Olympic View uh, 12 Neighborhood uh, Traffic Safety Project, Westway. And then the second one will be the 2013 Planning Commission Work Program on which the issues that have been brought by many of our uh, people who testified earlier will then be uh, raised and discussed. Uh, sorry, we had already put the order in, and that's the way it goes. But Westway is very important to all of us, so there you go. Anyway, uh, the city traffic uh, engineer, Rick Perez, will make a, a brief presentation. Thank you, Mayor. Good evening, Council members. Um, uh, Westway's had a, uh, a uh, long history, um, having petitioned several times since incorporation for a traffic calming project, and is historically not qualified due to low speeds within the neighborhood and volumes. Um, sometimes it takes a tragedy to uh, make things change and uh, that did occur with a fatal uh, bicycling accident. And uh, so now um, the neighborhood does qualify for um, the neighborhood traffic safety program. And um, in particular, um, that fatality gained two points. We need three points minimum to qualify. Um, 85th percentile speed about 28 <coughs> miles per hour on Southwest 333rd got one point and the fact that there is um, recreational facilities within the neighborhood gave it another half point it's also on a safe walk route to school designation so a uh, total of three and a half points thus qualifying for the neighborhood traffic safety program the proposal that was developed um, is a little bit unique um, it's not the typical speed hump application here Although there are two speed humps proposed, um, this is the Westway neighborhood and for orientation the east side is where 21st Avenue Southwest is here on the right end of the slide. 26th Avenue Southwest on the west side, this is 333rd and down here is 334th. Um, so the green designates the location of um, a speed hump on each one. and. Um, the rest involves converting the streets outlined here to one way. Um, so um, the other thing involved in that is um, it would create the opportunity to provide more on-street parking. Uh, we're proposing back-in angle parking for that um, to uh, increase, maximize the number of available parking spaces. There's also a separate proposal that um, is also on um, the agenda tonight to lower the speed limit to 20 miles per hour with this change. Um, 
So the intent of this is to um, narrow the street width available for through traffic to help reduce the speeds, um, create more on-street parking to address the overflow conditions that currently exist in many locations. Um, one of the historical issues we've had is um, sight distance at intersections, um, in part because of the number of parked vehicles. Also, the r street wideway is very narrow. Um, most of the right-of-way widths are 40 feet. Typically, we'd see 50 or 60 feet in a residential neighborhood. Um, and as a result, um, people have constructed fences, or sometimes the homes themselves are within the sight distance triangle at the intersections. So by reducing the number of turning movements at these intersections with the conversion of one-way streets, it also reduces the need for site, intersection sight distance in many cases. Um, one advantage of the ag, uh, back in angle parking is that it also provides a buffer between uh, the traveled way for motorized vehicles and non-motorized traffic, both cycling and pedestrians. So there are, of course, there's trade trade-offs for everything, um, and uh, the potential drawbacks with the one-way streets in particular is that it would increase out-of-direction travel for. Uh, certain residents. Um, there's no real mitigating measure available for that. Um, some streets will have a slight increase in volume. Um, based on our analyses and, and actual counts, the um, volumes in this neighborhood are actually very low. Um, the uh, main streets are classified as minor collectors, which could be up to 5,000 vehicles a day, and we're looking at about 600 right now and uh, local streets would all stay under 1,000, which is the maximum allowed under code. So um, we're well under those thresholds. Um, initially, in particular, there would be some significant enforcement necessary to ensure compliance with the one-way street restrictions in order to uh, minimize the potential for head-on collisions. Um, and uh, the police department has committed to providing emphasis enforcement to help with that transition. So, as I mentioned, we'll look, be looking at a speed limit um, elsewhere in the agenda. Um, so, consistent with the normal neighbor traffic safety program process, we sent out ballots to all within 600 feet of any proposed change. We sent out a total of 201 ballots. We had about a 9 or 20% return rate. Um, of those ballots returned, about a 2 to 1 margin in favor of the changes. Um, the majority of the changes, uh, or majority of the no votes, did express uh, specifically that they were opposed because of the one-way street conversion. Um, another thing that's a departure from the normal neighborhood traffic safety program project is that we estimate this uh, to be a total expense of about thirty thousand dollars. Currently, the council adopted neighborhood traffic safety policies limit is fifteen thousand dollars per year per neighborhood. Um, but uh, there is adequate budget to address this because anticipating this, we had proposed to carry forward last year's neighborhood traffic safety <coughs> budget into this year, um, anticipating this project would be presented to the council. So um, options, uh, option one is to approve the proposal to provide the one-way streets, the back and angle parking and speed humps and allow the expenditure to exceed the $15,000 per neighborhood per year limit, or do not authorize a proposal and provide direction. And uh, that's... Mr. President, if you'd be nice enough to go back to the original map, yes. which shows exactly what we're doing, and point out to the council so we're all on the same page, the traffic flow in terms of where people are, just so everybody knows. Okay. Uh, there we go. Chief Wilson, uh, Mr. Rowe, and I actually went out and drove it uh, with Mr. Perez uh, several times to get a feel for it. But uh, Rick, if you'd be nice enough to just show the, the flow in. Okay. So um, right now, if you're coming in on 21st, you're entering past the community center um, at the second intersection, at which is uh, 334th and 22nd. Uh, you would enter into a one-way roadway on 22nd place northbound, and then it would bend westbound onto 333rd, that's all one way westbound. 334th would be um, all one way eastbound, back to that intersection. Uh, 23rd Avenue would be one way southbound, 
and uh, 24th would be one way northbound. So um, it balances the flows pretty effectively. We'd be adding a lot of uh, backing angle parking here on 333rd. Um, this was the area where we could squeeze that in. Um, and um, then um, the sidewalk that, very narrow sidewalk that exists on the south side would be protected from vehicular traffic along this segment. Um, on 334th, um, we already have a shoulder walkway protected by a curb on the north side of the roadway. So um, uh, the only additional parking would be on the south side. We would have um, regular parallel parking on the south side here on 333rd, or 334th, I'm sorry. Um, right now, um, the driveways are so extensive here on uh, 23rd and 24th that they're, well, on the east side here on um, 23rd, you could have parallel parking on that side. Um, but on 24th, there's no opportunity for that right now. So um, this would involve um, a lot of striping, um, turn arrows, and a large number of signs. Um, but, uh, um, and actually citing all the signs is gonna be a bit of a challenge. There's some new federal requirements about one-way street signing um, to, uh, ensure people don't make that make errors um, and uh, so given the narrow right-of-way um, that for, is the largest technical perspective uh, from a technical perspective is the largest challenge the largest challenge from an enforcement perspective is making sure that uh, the neighborhood gets trained on how to use the streets properly one of the major issues which you might address has to do with the fact that there was concern by all of us for those of us who've been involved with West for 20 years, about those two streets and whether or not we'd be increasing traffic significantly. But the fact is that in terms, I think it's, is it 21st first or 23rd first? Mm -hmm. um, people who would use that to loop, there aren't very many houses there, uh, so you wouldn't see significant travel on 23rd from people right. because if you are going down that way, there's those houses. And right. then there's only a few houses which would make that turn in order right. to shorten their requirement to go around the entire neighborhood. Right. So basically you'd be looking at these houses here and these houses on 22nd Court would have to come around to get back out. So that would be the increase on this. Um, however, you'd also have the commensurate decrease from people that would normally be heading north will now be heading north on 22nd instead of 23rd. But that was a concern, uh, yes. those of us, when we went out there to make sure that we weren't putting a lot of traffic down those relatively narrow, relatively narrow streets, uh, which in many cases uh, have a lot of parking. The other, I think, advantage of this approach, and this is a major change, the other advantage of this approach is some of the cars that are parked in those two streets that are 23rd and I don't, what's the next 24th. street? 24th. And 24th are there because there's no place else to park and by providing some additional parking along um, the one-way streets it might take some of the pressure off and actually open that up so council member honda um, i have a few concerns one is cooperation of the people who live there and in, in going the one way in and the one way out uh, the lack of of 200 ballots went out and only 40 came back that's that's a concern to me but I just had a thought about the parking there, and, I, and I've driven through there many times, and I've walked through there, and there are a lot of cars that are parked outside the houses. But there's uh, the community center has a parking lot. Is there any way that we could allow homeowners to park their cars in the parking lot there to take some of the cars off of the street? Well, that would be up to the Homeowners Association. That community center is actually owned and operated by the Homeowners Association. So they could do that, I suppose. Um, I, whether people would be willing to walk that far would be another issue. Um, you know, certainly for residents that were close to that, no problem. Um, the ones that might, you know, might be looking at a quarter mile walk to their car might not be so willing. So with the amount of ballots that were returned? Mm -hmm. um, you know, given the, our, 
our history with the neighborhood traffic safety program has been we typically get low voter turnout in areas uh, that have a lot of rental units so um, although I share the concern that we may not be getting that representative a sample um, it's not an unusual circumstance and actually we've had some neighborhoods where we've gotten lower ballot turnout um, than this so um, it's not unprecedented how will it be enforced will the police be giving warnings out tickets out how, how much time do we expect the police department to be there I don't know that I can answer that uh, if chief Wilson I would anticipate that we would follow a, a similar process that we have before with different neighborhoods or substantial changes in traffic uh, plans or uh, you know as we've done in the past we would do uh, like a 30-day warning period uh, we would have education materials for residents which oftentimes those who may not be familiar with this are those who live in the area that we would uh, implement a plan similar to that and certainly in our mind enforcement would be the last resort um, after we have made sure that that education piece and of a substantial change for the neighborhood uh, occurs thank you councilmember duclo yeah i am uh, following up with uh, councilmember honda i'm a little, a little concerned about the the uh, conversion to one-way street and i know about the the how the ballots come back and everything because my neighborhood tried to get some devices and we didn't qualify um, but I, I really wonder what's the education going to be and how are we going to, t to get people to accept the fact that they're all of a sudden they're only going to be able to go one way and they're going to have to go around and and cut down only on one and cut up on one um, yeah. um, well that, that, that kind of, that's what worries me I want to know mm -hmm. how we're going to educate them on okay. that well, we have been working with the Homeowners Association, actually. Um, the Homeowners Association voted in favor of that. The board okay. did. So, right. um, you know, so it wasn't. You, you, uh, will they get some information to make sure that all the people there get the information about this? Well, we certainly can um, send out another mailing. Um, this, this graphic actually went out with the ballots. We can send that out again. I'm, I'm not sure you need another mailing. I would like to have it given to the Homeowners Association and have them perhaps walk around to the houses and hand it out. And, and we could certainly request that they do that. Um, you know, just the sheer number of signs involved, I think, will also help educate people. Um, and uh, A little um, advance warning helps. And, and yes, certainly um, advance warning would be useful. Thank you. Are there any other questions? Uh, Rick? Seeing none, um, Council Member Selsky, do you have a motion? Uh, yes, I do, Mayor Priest. I move approval of the installation of two speed humps on Southwest 333rd Street and Southwest 334th Street, conversion to one-way streets and installation of back-in angle parking in Westway, exceeding the annual expenditure limit per neighborhood. Is there a second? Second. It has been moved and seconded. Is there a discussion? <laughs> <laughs> Seeing none, all in favor of the motion, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you very much, Mr. Perez. Thank you. We're now moving to ordinances, and we will see Mr. Perez again because the first is council. Oh, we're not. Sorry, I, I spaced. Age thing again. We seem to be emphasizing age tonight, don't we? We're moving now to the 2013 Planning Commission Work Program. Now we get Ms. Clark again, and then Mr. Perez in the next one. So, Ms. Clark. And this is an examination of the issue that you all were nice enough to come in and express your thoughts on. Good evening again. Um, so right now I'd like to make a short presentation on the 2013 Planning Commission Work Program. So the policy question is how should the work program for this year be prioritized? We completed nine code of, well, first of all, what we'd like to tell you is what did we accomplish last year, just basically summarizes it, so to give you an idea of what this year's work program might look like compared to last year's. So we complete, completed nine code amendments in 2012, and we went through them in detail at the LUTC. I'm not going to go over them unless you want me to do it. 
um, because I can. But most of these code amendments were related to streamlining the development review process and encouraging economic development. We also adopted the Twin Lake Siberia Plan. So these are um, policies that were changed. We adopted the Twin Lakes Siberia Plan, we adopted the Bicycle and Pedestrian Master Plan, and we adopted policies to increase access to healthy foods. We also adopted the 2012 Comprehensive Plan Amendments. Those were the uh, annual amendments for last year. We always like to remind the Council that we have a limited staff, and, and that plays into how much we can do each year. The long-range staff is comprised of 1.5 uh, full-time equivalents. The development review staff, is they're the ones that review the development applications that come in, are comprised of 2.5 full-time equivalents. As you know, applications for development activity have been increasing. So it's very unlikely that the current planning staff will be able to assist much with code amendments this year. In fact, we've already seen a shift where the long-range staff has been assisting with development review in the first um, months of this year. We have, um, now we're going to go over into potential items for this year, and we do have one carryover item from last year, and that's the amendments to the Federal, Re Federal Revised Code to implement the Urban Agriculture Goals and Policies. And a number of you have been involved in it. This is looking at, you know, where would community gardens be, pea patches, um, farmers markets. And Every year we do have to do the annual updates. We just went over that, the comprehensive plan amendments that went, just went through selection. So we do accept requests from citizens for both code amendments and comprehensive plan amendments. Um, no requests for code amendments were received for this year. And you, we just talked about the three requests for the comprehensive plan amendments that were received. So long-range staff also, besides doing conference plan amendments and code amendments, there are other reporting that we do each year. And for the first part of the year, usually for the first three to four months, we prepare reports for the Puget Sound Regional Council, the Office of Financial Management, and King County. Throughout the year, we also respond to surveys from University of Washington, Puget Sound Regional Council and other institutions, we also respond to amendments to the countywide planning policies. So now we go to the Mayor's recommendation for the Planning Commission's work program for this year. Um, required actions, we do have to update the comp plan. Discretionary actions, and the discretionary actions are actions that we could do, and we're going to ask you guys to prioritize it tonight. So we've got high priority, medium priority, and low priority. And within each of these priority sections, they're not prioritized. So it would depend on if, say, for example, this goes forward as the high priority, what we attack first would depend on the expertise of people who's available to do work at a certain time, how much how much work is involved. A lot of times what we like to do is, the, you know what they say, the pick the low hanging fruit. If we can get something simple, completed in a timely manner, we do that first. Sometimes we do have to do the more important things because that's what the council wants, even though it might take a longer time period. So in this high priority section, we've got the urban agricultural code amendments. We have adopted a more streamlined process for buying and site plans, amended regulations to increase exempt levels for SEPA, and this is based on a state law that was just passed that increased the exempt levels. We also would like to amend the process for updating the comprehensive plan. As I mentioned to you when we, when I did the discussion on the comp plan, we have the selection process tonight and then we'll go all the way through Planning Commission, LUTC and back to the City Council. So we would like to simplify that where we only bring it to you once. Um, also, we would like to amend the non-conforming provisions because right now we're finding that they can provide a barrier to economic development. In the medium priority, we've got broadened uses and standardized bulk and dimensional requirements by zone and provide more appropriate setbacks and landscape buffers for commercial uses. In this particular code amendment, looks at maybe um, not separating by use, but looking at more if things have the same, have no impacts, can they be uh, um, located together? Sort of more going towards maybe like a form-based code. 
Um, also, we have amend regulations for mobile home manufactured home parks, and we heard many people speak to that tonight. Um, no, I'm sorry, not this, not this one. The, the, the next one is they spoke to create a special zoning district for mobile home manufactured home parks. But these two are very related because if we do create a special zoning district for um, mobile home and manufactured home parks, we would have to look at adopting regulations for that district. Also, in the medium priority, is adopt zoning regulations for the Twin Lakes commercial sub area. We adopted the sub-area plan last year. This would be implementing that plan. The next code amendment would be to increase the maximum allowable building height in the city center zoning district. Right now, the way the code reads, we can allow increased height, but it's based on certain conditions. Also, making review of variances and administrative process. Right now, the variances go to the hearings examiner, and it would be easier just for it to be reviewed by staff because the criteria is pretty straightforward. Low priority is allow oversized vehicles and approved enclosures in residential zones, allow senior housing slash assisted living in the professional office zone. That's already part of the work program, but we're just waiting until the applicant is ready to move forward. Um, that came, that was approved last year. Also adopting an ordinance addressing historic preservation and then if we can get to housekeeping amendments. So what we'd like to do this year is to start the 2015 major comprehensive plan update and we would continue it into 2014 and we have to complete it by June 30th, 2015. It used to be every seven years that we had to do a major update and the last deadline was 2011 but the state kept extending it because they had given us, given local jurisdictions grants but then they were able, unable to um, to give us the grant and therefore they extended our time period. But I just attended a conference in Chelan and it made me realize that it's, we have to get to this, this update very soon because it'll take, it'll take a little longer and it'll be more detailed than we envisioned <coughs> or we were envisioning. Um, so now um, this was presented at LUTC and the LUTC had one addition that they wanted to make to the medium priority and that's to amend regulations pertaining to types of improvements or structures allowed in required yards. Right now, an improvement or structure is, let, uh, let me see what a required yard is. Like in a single family zone, you have, your house has to be five feet away from the side and five feet away from the rear property line and 20 feet from the front. So when we talk about yards, that's what it is. Five feet on the side, 20, side and rear, 20 feet in front. So the way our codes are written is that we cannot have any improvements or structures over 18 inches that extend more than five feet into a side yard, which means in a typical house, if it has five foot side yards, this, any structure cannot be more than 18 inches tall. And we're finding out that that's causing a problem for, for some um, property owners. And I'll give you an example. A uh, property owner wanted to put a generator in the side yard. That's not allowed because it's greater than 18 inches high. And in order for him to put the generator in the side yard, he would have to apply for a variance. First of all, he'd have to meet the variance criteria. It costs money for a variance. The variance goes through a public hearing. To, in front of the hearings examiner. So this would be a good thing for us to relook at this particular code section because uh, we are aware that other cities do allow them in side yards with, under certain conditions. So the council options is that the council may add items to or remove items from the 2013 Planning Commission work program or may modify the recommended priority order. And that's the end of the presentation. Ms. Clark, I know you were at least attempting to get a map of the potential areas as far as the mobile home parks. Were, were yes. we able to do that or I, not? I, I was able. So for council information, just so we understand what in particular this discussion was about, uh, I think it would be helpful. Okay, so we have eight mobile home parks in the city. Belmore, they're there by number so you can see them. We've got the zoning. Most of them are zoned multifamily, RM 3600. There are two of them that are RM 1800, Crestwood, Laurel Valley, and these are the number of spaces in each mobile home park. So 
there's a total of 168, uh, 1,168 spaces in the city of Federal Way. We have provided the council with additional information prior to the meeting on this particular issue. Are there any other questions or comments by the council in terms of a request to Margaret for information, or would you prefer to move on to a potential motion? Any other questions? or? So then, Councilmember Selsky, thank you very much, Ms. Clark, as thank always. You. Uh, you did underscore the challenges we face, and this is one of those hidden heroes where difficult decisions were made by the council in terms of staffing, and this is just one of those areas where we continue to do an excellent job given the limited staffing we have. So thank you, Margaret, for everything you do. Uh, Councilmember Selsky, do you have a motion that might provide a discussion point? Uh, yes, I do, Mayor Priest. I move to amend the 2013 Planning Commission's work plan as follows. First, to move the adoption of specific zoning district for mobile manufactured home parks to high priority. And secondly, to move the amendment of regulations to provide a more streamlined process for binding site plans to medium priority. Is there a second? Second. It has been moved and seconded. Is there discussion? Councilmember Duclos? Or? Yes, thank you. I, I would just like to speak to this a little bit because several months ago I was asked by uh, uh, Ms. Altman if I would meet with her and I said sure and we set up a meeting and, and in the, in the uh, Nyberg room and I walked in and uh, the table was full of people, some wearing green shirts and, and me and I didn't know anything really about this issue. But they made a presentation to me um, that I really felt that this is something that we really look, need to look at. And they asked, what, what, what do you need to do? And I said, well, I have to find out. But they asked if I would be the champion. And I said, yes, I would, even though it was not my committee. So I did move this forward because you saw the numbers. There's a lot of people, a lot of seniors out there. These are their homes, and we need to be working with them and supporting them and making sure that they can stay there in those homes. And as you heard, and this group has done an awful lot of work. They have done this other places. It has been tested by the courts. And I think um, I really support moving this up to the high priority. So thank you, folks. And thank you, Council Member Selsky. Are there any other discussion? Uh, Council Member Selsky, since yes. it's your motion, and then yeah, thank you, Mayor Priest. I'd like to thank Margaret and the planning staff, uh, Isaac, uh, for all the work you guys are doing on this. This is a lot of work. It's a lot of detailed work, and uh, some of it with, with much passion. Um, we heard from a lot of citizens tonight, and uh, I was in that same meeting with Dini, with, with the group as well, and uh, was educated as well. And what we're talking about here is, is people's homes, their lives, the places they lived, and the places they plan to live, as we heard uh, uh, the testimony tonight as well. Uh, I personally have a sister-in-law who has a family that is in a manufactured home park, and I can't imagine what she would do with her family if she was forced to move in 12 months. It would be very, very difficult for her and for everybody uh, that this affects, so uh, I'm very supportive of it as well. Councilmember Honda. Thank you. Um, I have a question, and I'm wondering if the mobile home parks that we have in Federal Way, if they're filled to capacity or if there's more land where uh, more homes could be put up. It, does anyone know that? Um, but I do support this. I think it would be very difficult uh, to attempt to move one of these homes and or almost impossible. And I, I, I will support moving this up. We can part of this discussion. Having worked on this issue for almost a decade, particularly with Kloshi Ilahi uh, as a state representative, I'm certainly, yes, I'm certainly aware of this issue. I'm not sure right tonight we can provide a specific answer in terms of whether there is space availability. In general, that is one of the challenges, is that there is no place to move. And in many cases, there hasn't been significant development or extension of these um, mobile home parks. Uh, having said that, that would be one of the things that we'd be able to provide uh, uh, using our GIS system to identify potential land availability and other things. And that would be one of the priorities as far as the reviewed by the staff so they can give you a thoughtful answer in terms of exactly um, what some of the issues are as you go forward in terms of making a decision on potential, potentially addressing the issue. Any other questions or comments? Yes, Councilmember Burbage. Thank you, Mayor Priest. I 
appreciate folks coming forward and sharing with us their concerns. We're talking about people's security and, and certainty as to where they live and where they can anticipate continuing to live. And so recognizing that, I am supporting um, moving this forward to a high priority. And I look forward to the, the, the work that staff will do in sharing with us and identifying uh, the related issues so that we can have a good opportunity to review that work and make a reasonable decision. Thank you. Councilmember Noble Gulliford. Uh, I too also support um, placing this in a high priority. Having a background in real estate, I did experience uh, frustration of uh, finding a place for uh, retired people that wanted to scale down and uh, live in a mobile home park but we're unable to find space to do so. Uh, it's an exceptional situation, especially Belmore, where they have a location in an urban area where they can uh, shop uh, reasonably close by. They can walk also to buy their groceries and so on. And I feel that this is uh, going to be um, a good step to provide some consistency and uh, hopefully some permanency in their lives uh, over time, uh, especially if the real estate market begins to uh, take off and the land is, vacant land is uh, definitely a priority to find in our urban areas right now for developers and infill. And I think that this will definitely help solve a, a partial solution for affordable housing. Are there any comments? Yes. Uh, thank Hi. you. I just wanted to also thank you for coming forth and bringing this to our attention. I, it's something that has resonated with me since I learned about it, um, recognizing that <clears throat> so many people have challenging times right now, and um, especially seniors. Um, so I, I applaud you for that, and uh, I'm, I'm happy that we, you know, sounds like we're going to move this up on the priority list. So, Any other comments or questions on the amendment? Seeing none, all in favor of the amendment, please say <coughs> aye. 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 Opposed? The amendment carries. The motion carries. Councilmember Selsky, do you have an additional motion? Uh, yes, I do, Mayor Priest. I move approval of the 2013 Planning Commission work program with the following modifications. First, add structures allowed in the setback uh, in the Federal Way Revised Code 19.125.160 as a medium priority. Second, move the adoption of specific zoning district for mobile manufactured home parks to high priority. And third, move the amendment of regulations to provide a more streamlined process for binding site plans to medium priority on Exhibit one, uh, B1. Is there a second? Second. It has been moved and seconded. Is there discussion? Seeing none, all in favor of the motion, please say aye. 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 Opposed? The motion carries. And thank you all for coming in. We appreciate it. Now, Mr. Perez. Good evening again. So, <clears throat> continuing on with the Westway saga, um, we had two requests for speed limit changes um, from citizens. One was uh, Westway um, to reduce uh, speed limit within the neighborhood from 25 to 20 miles per hour. Uh, there was also a second one for 356th Street between 1st Avenue South and Highway 99 to increase that from 35 to 40 miles per hour. So um, the uh, state law requires a uh, engineering and traffic investigation to revise speed limits and the federal manual on uniform traffic control devices which has to be adopted by the state and we also adopt in our city code. Um, provides criteria for doing that. Um, so in general, um, lower speed limits do reduce stopping site distances and collision severity. Um, they're intended to supplement, not substitute for, motorist judgment. Um, and uh, the, one of the problems we have with speed limits is that uh, if drivers do not consider them reasonable, they will be violated. Um, and there's also um, a tendency for um, an increased collision risk if there's a wide variation in speeds, which tends to happen if speed limits are set too low. 
So as a result of all that, balancing that, um, uh, the uh, historical recommendation has been to set the speed limit as close as possible to the 85th percentile speed, which is, uh, for those not familiar with the statistics, basically it says 15% of the drivers out there are going to drive too fast regardless of conditions. So we're trying to just be reasonable to the reasonable driver. Um, so um, in the uh, council packet, there was a number of examples where we've done before and after studies of revising the speed limits. Um, and the key things to note is that typically driver speeds are not changed significantly by revising speed limits. It takes uh, an inordinate amount of enforcement to continue keeping uh, a lid on it if people perceive the speed limit to be unreasonable. Um, and typically we've seen safety improve the closer you get that speed limit to the 85th percentile speeds. However, changing the roadway itself, um, which is the whole thing with traffic calming where you're trying to change the physical environment, can affect speeds. Um, so um, with that, uh, the specific locations is Westway proposal um, as in conjunction with our neighborhood traffic safety project discussed previously. Um, so you've seen that before. A um, couple pictures of um, here on the right is the wide street. It's an example of the wide streets in Westway. Um, basically two lanes on street parking on one side um, that would be converted to um, the back in angle parking on this side. Um, so you're seeing a fair amount of the utilization of the on street parking. So this is 34 feet of pavement um, with a shoulder walkway on the south. Um, down here, this is actually 30 feet of pavement, and you can see a couple of these vehicles parked illegally. Um, the roads are basically straight. Um, we do have sight distance restrictions at the intersection, in part because of the parked vehicles, the narrow rights of way and the fences. Um, on this street here, we had an 85th percentile speed of 28 miles per hour. 24 on the parallel street on 334th. Um, within the entire neighborhood, within the past three years, we did have the one uh, fatal bicycle collision, um, um, but that was the only one. Um, so, uh, but we do have some extremely narrow streets. So, um, basically, the biggest issue here um, is that we have a driveway density in this neighborhood that is unique in the city. Um, there's nothing even approaching the driveway density you have in this neighborhood. And as a result, uh, in conjunction with the traffic calming project, um, that uh, staff is supporting the request to reduce that speed limit. So the other one on 356, the proposal was to raise the speed limit from 35 to 40. Um, so we start off at Highway 99, we have a five lane cross section with curb gutter, sidewalk, street lights, the whole nine yards. Um, you get up by Brook Lake Church and it narrows down to three lanes mm -hmm. with some pretty narrow shoulders. And then once you get past the church, it narrows down to two lanes with shoulders that are actually pretty narrow. Um, and this is also going down a bit of a grade and hence the driver complains that, well, everybody's going 35 or, you know, well over 35 because of the grades. Um, we, had, we do have some students that walk here, although it's not a designated safe walking route. We have seen uh, a number of students walking to Todd Beamer High here. Um, the uh, collision rate is less than average for principal arterials. 85th percentile speed is 42. Um, so. Staff recommendation was due to the narrow shoulders and pedestrian conflicts. We are not supporting the request to increase the speed limit, um, so leaving it at 35 miles per hour. So um, option one is to move to second reading on May 7th to approve the proposal to amend um, the code per the mayor's recommendation or do not authorize the proposal. And uh, so option one is the recommendation. Thank you. Are there any questions of Mr. Perez? Councilmember Honda. Uh, reducing the speed in Westway from 25 to 20. With all the other changes occurring there and the speeds that you recorded, I'm wondering if that's going to be necessary or if it's just another change that the people will, will, will get and not necessarily be happy with. 
Well, I, the request came from the neighborhood. So it, was, it actually came from the homeowner association and was integral to the uh, traffic calming proposal. So um, we just have to s provide it as separate because one's just a discretionary action, the other one is an, amend is an ordinance. So. Well, once again, if we're going to reduce the speed, I, mm -hmm. it's gonna, I would like it to, to be enforced. Absolutely. I'm, otherwise, there's no use in reducing it. I would concur with that. Any other questions of Mr. Perez? Seeing none, uh, Council Member Selsky, do you have a motion? Uh, yes, I do, Mayor Perez. Oh, hold it. Will the City Clerk read the title of the proposed oh. ordinance? Thank you, Ms. Richardson. <laughs> An ordinance of the City of Federal Way, Washington, relating to speed limits, amending Federal Way Revised Code 8.30.040. The Deputy Mayor has reminded me that after two and a half years, you would think I would be able to get that right, but apparently <laughs> there are certain things that we will never get right. Um, now that the Clerk has read the title of the proposed ordinance, Council Member Selsky, do you have a motion? I indeed do. I move approval of the ordinance on speed limit revisions and forward to the May 7th, 2013 City Council meeting for enactment. Is there a second? Second. second. Moved and second. Is there discussion? See none, all in favor of the motion, please say aye. 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 Opposed? The motion carries. In fairness to me, usually the city clerk puts this with large underlines and yellow print on here so I don't forget it, and in this case, <laughs> we move now to uh, Council Bill Number 623, amending the um, Basic Federal Way Code, <laughs> primarily for technical reasons. And I turn now to our City Attorney, Ms. Richardson. Thank you. This is really a housekeeping ordinance that we're doing. Um, in our code, uh, we refer to the RCW, and we noticed in the code that we had not incorporated uh, state laws regarding misdemeanors for public officials. So we've got about nine state laws that we're incorporating there in uh, the proposed ordinance. And the other one is with initiative 502, when it was first enacted, the code reviser had not codified the RCW regarding um, making it a, an infraction to uh, open or consume marijuana products in the public. So um, we had, uh, we're on the leading edge and Thank used you. the exact language from the initiative. Um, this change then would take out that language and incorporate the, the state law. Those are the changes. Are there any questions of Ms. Richardson? Will the city clerk read the title of the proposed ordinance? Thank you very much for the highlighting. I very much appreciate it. An ordinance of the City of Federway, Washington, relating to criminal law update, creating a new section in Chapter 6.50, Federal Revised Code, Public Officers, amending Federal Revised Code 6.50.020, Public Officer Defined, amending Federal, Revi Federal Way Revised Code 6.10.030, Statutes Adopted, and repealing Federal Way Revised Code 6.10.035. Councilmember Honda, do you have a motion? Yes, uh, I move to forward approval of the ordinance to the May 7th, 2013 City Council meeting for adoption. Is there a second? Second. It has been moved and seconded. Is there a discussion? Seeing none, all in favor of the motion, please say aye. 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 Opposed? The motion carries. We now move to Council reports. Councilmember Duplo. Well, I'm trying to see if I can cut down on the two pages here. So I was in committee meetings all last Wednesday. Um, okay. We had the Regional Policy Committee met, and uh, we, we had a little bit of tension, I think, between the King County Council and the, the, the cities, and uh, so one of our discussions had to do with uh, making a statement about the charter on the, our Regional Policy Committee and what that, com what that committee can have brought before it and take action on, and so uh, we did a an interpretation of the of the uh, charter and read it into the record. We again had another presentation of the uh, Emergency Medic One, Emergency Medical Services uh, Strategic Plan, and the renewal of funding. Uh, as you know, I reported last time that one city had opposed it, and the way the statute is written right now, if one city opposes it, the whole plan would would die and wouldn't go out for re, uh, voter approved renewal. 
However, um, during the time between the, the two weeks we were out, uh, there was some changes made to it, and the current language um, was accepted by us because what it did was uh, set up an independent analysis to help determine the number of providers needed to deliver Medic One services in the future. Uh, that seemed reasonable to review. Also possible uh, advanced life support impacts which might be triggered, triggered by fi fire agency realignments due to potential fire districts realignment suit annexation. And anyway, it did mention a pathway for the one city and that city had pulled its, uh, its objections and so we did pass this on to the King County for them to take uh, action on it to be on the November ballot. I do think that at some point that we should take a position on this issue for the, because uh, this came up at the PIC, and I, which I was at at the night, and I had to address, I addressed it, but I told them that our council hadn't taken a, posi a position on this, and there were several other councils around the table <coughs> that had, it hadn't been brought to them yet either. So, but I think we might want to get this on one of our council committees and <coughs> and have it. It will be on probably on the vote in November. I do want to say that there was young man, one young man from Federal Way who had done some uh, emergency EMT training with our local fire district um, and he spoke in favor of this unfortunately he took off right after that smart fellow right? so I didn't get a chance to talk to him and anyway the uh, next item was the annual mental health and chemical dependency this is the mid tax and uh, they gave us a report on on how it's doing and I have a copy of that if people would like to see it um, we talked about the recovery and resilience oriented behavior health service plan for 20 12, 2017, uh, the county is ready to enact a new recovery plan, which would place the one, replace the one that's been in effect since 2011. Um, and so that was just an informational uh, briefing. Then the South, the Sound Cities Association's Policies I Issue Committee met that night, and so um, uh, Council Member Burbage, who is the full-time representative to it, was not able to make it as the alternate I uh, attended. And we discussed the parks, and the county parks and, and levy issue. And I know Council Member Honda is going to be hearing that in her, in her county. Uh, a lot of us, again, had not taken a position on it, but it is slated to be on the August 6th primary ballot. And so the sooner that we can take a, a position, I did speak to the fact that our city would probably support the, the uh, continuation of the the uh, first part of it, but would, would probably have more difficulty accepting the second part, which is the uh, uh, additional tax that would come with it. I talked about not just our city, but the people that live in South County and uh, the impact. They always talk about the, uh, what it would mean for somebody owning a $300,000 home. <laughs> I don't think they realize that some of us some people don't own that kind of a home and a, and a tax of 50 or 60 or $70 a month or even for 25 to 30 or $40 a month would tax their budget. So, And also we saw that um, reading what I saw, most of the benefits seem to be to the east side. So it's something that I think um, as a council we need to be taking this position on pretty soon, especially if it's going to be on an August ballot. Um, Let's see. Okay, and then there was another for the uh, the regional transit committee of which Council Member Burgett is Burbage is a member. Was to the motion was to recommend to the SCA Board of Directors to support the development of a King County Metro Long Range Plan, basing its Long Range Plan on the comprehensive plans of cities. And this passed, and it will be taken up by the SCA Board of Directors meeting tomorrow. And I am on the Board of Directors. And uh, finally, kind of wrapping up here, what would be a report without something about solid waste? At the April 12th meeting of the MISWAC, the Metropolitan Solid Waste Management Action Committee, the discussion centered around, around how Bellevue's rejection of the new interlocal agreement, of which Federal Way and several uh, cities have signed, would impact the rest of us, and then the plans for transfer upgrades. So this is going to be being looked at uh, by MISWAC um, over the next couple of months. And I think Sound Cities Association will be, uh, has been requested to look at the transfer system plan also. 
Uh, again, I said I'll be tomorrow attending the board meeting of Sound Cities. And um, finally, the next meeting of the Finance, Economic Development, and Regional Affairs, Affairs Committee will be Tuesday the 23rd at 5.30 in the High Levels Room. Thank you very much, Councilman. Thank you very much, Council Member Duclos. Council Member Double Gulliver. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, uh, on Saturday, April 12th, I attended the Salmon Release Celebration at the West Alibos Park. And uh, to re reiterate what the mayor had said, it was a, a very wonderful and educational uh, program that uh, many organizations put on. Uh, and uh, it would be nice to be able to see something very similar to that that would be available to the public so that we can begin educating the, the cycle also of the salmon and how to protect our uh, groundwater and so on. On April 13th, I attended the annual fundraiser tea and awards luncheon uh, for the Seroptimus in International of Federal Way. The guest speaker was Kathleen Saborin, who shared her outstanding story of how she overcame a history of abuse by her family, her school, and her husband's. The Seroptimist organization, their goal is to make a difference for women, and they've been doing this since 1921. On April 18th, I will be volunteering as a judge at the Sequoia Middle School American History Project. Eighth grade students have selected a question to answer such as, why is the Gettysburg Address considered the greatest speech in American history? Then they develop their thesis. They do a presentation before the judges. This is an incredible program to provide a venue for students to become more familiar with the history of our country. And then on Saturday, April 20th, volunteers will uh, begin and to celebrate Earth Day by uh, parks cleanup throughout the Federal Way community. And I encourage you to attend, uh, bring your work gloves and your tools and uh, so that we can clean up our parks and enjoy the day and meet other volunteers that share in the same spirit. Thank you. Thank you very much, Council Member Dolsky. <laughs> Thank you, Mayor Priest. Uh, tonight on the agenda, there were several land use and transportation items that uh, we discussed. And uh, a lot of the heavy lifting and detailed study from that committee occurs at the Land Use and Transportation Committee meeting. And the reason I mention that, because our next committee meeting is scheduled for Monday, May 6th at 5.30 right here in these council chambers. And we'll no doubt be tackling some, some new and exciting issues as well. Um, it, was, uh, it was really nice to be at the Lions Club fundraiser this past Saturday, where the, uh, where the police and the, the, the fire department uh, played a great basketball game. Um, based, on, uh, based on what I saw uh, and the dismantling of the fire department by, uh, by the police department um, and the level of play by the police department, I would say that the, uh, they had some ringers out there and, uh, and you could definitely tell. That was a very intense game. It was a, it was a fun event um, and I know the police uh, department, uh, they've got bragging rights for this next year, which I'm glad to see. But uh, great event. Thank you, Dick Mayer and the Lions Club for putting that on. And uh, lastly, um, I'd like to endorse that Earth Corps event that's coming up on Saturday. I've been talking about the Earth Corps for the past couple months. Now that the weather is getting nice, uh, this Saturday at the Hylobos, it should be a, a great day to get out there and, and help. Uh, I plan to be there, and I uh, would love to see a lot of folks get, get, uh, roll up their sleeves and get out there, and let's help Earth Corps help our city beautify our parks. So thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Shelsky. Councilmember Burbage. Thank you, Mayor Priest. Uh, last week, the Lodging Tax Advisory Committee Subcommittee, the Tourism Enhancement Grants Group, uh, had their interviews of applicants for those grants. And um, then the, they came to the next, uh, that was on Monday. And Wednesday, those those recommendations came to the Lodging Tax Advisory Committee for discussion. And they will then come to the, the council committee and uh, the FEDRAC finance committee and then full council for discussion. So those will be um, interesting for the council, full council to review. Um, 
This morning I attended a meeting of the South County Area Transportation Board and I also want to add my appreciation to uh, Councilmember Duclo for uh, attending the Public Issues Committee of the Sound Transit Association last week. Um, she really had a very full day and with meetings all day and um, many issues to cover. And one of the additional issues that was covered there and has been covered at um, uh, the South County Transportation Board is that of tolling. Um, with the gas tax being a less uh, efficient and less uh, productive source of revenue for keeping up our roads, uh, some other potential sources have been looked to and one of those is tolling. And uh, as this is discussed in different forums, it's become apparent that there are some specific concerns. For example, if one particular road or bridge is tolled, then the alternative uh, is sometimes experiences a heavier amount of traffic. There are other concerns too, uh, people who need to use a particular road to get to work, the kind of uh, uh, burden that, that places on their budgets and there are additional concerns. So I would like to see this uh, uh, brought forward to our council as a point of discussion, probably at the land use transportation level initially um, for some discussion. It's going to be increasingly um, discussed as a potential source of the needed revenue. Uh, also at the South County Transportation Board meeting this morning, there was uh, a presentation by the King County Metro Transit about their needs for transit funding and uh, the fact that a current source of funding, the congestion fee, is um, set to expire. So they're looking at potential um, cuts in transit that would be quite significant. We'll be hearing more about those. And that would happen if there is not another source of funding or sources of funding identified either by the legislature or through some other means. Um, the last several days, have, as have, has been mentioned, have been very busy with wonderful community activities. The Seroptimus tea was very inspiring. The release of the salmon also, and the, certainly the basketball game by our police folks and the fire folks. Um, and in addition, as was mentioned, the uh, volunteers who are going to come forward this weekend to do important work in our parks, that's very much appreciated. And I, I want to thank you, you all who are planning to participate in that. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Burbage. Deputy Mayor Farrell. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. The uh, basketball game was great. I brought my five-year-old son, Benjamin, and I think that was actually the very first basketball game he's ever seen. So I had no idea that he would be so into watching the police uh, beat the uh, firefighters. So <laughs> there's a lot of, he got pretty emotionally invested. I, at some point I thought, God, they better win. <laughs> So uh, that was a lot of fun. It was great to see uh, the chief and his son uh, playing as well, and, and it was just a, it was a great time by all. And there were some uh, demonstrations uh, with uh, the karate uh, folks were wow. really uh, just amazing, and uh, oh, it was just great. It was a, you know uh, Bob Derrigan and you know everybody over at the, at the Lions just did a fantastic job. So it's a worthy cause. And then I watched Ben uh, play his actually very first uh, soccer game on Sunday. So uh -huh. at Decatur High School, and there were a lot of folks out in the community for that, and it's great to see everybody out enjoying the weather. So it's my report. Thank you. Great. Councilmember Honda. Thank you. Um, I want to talk again about the Municipal Court and um, Art Commission contest. It's for grades 1 to 12. The deadline is this Friday, April 19th, and entries must be received by this Friday, and you can drop them off at the community center probably by 5 o'clock. There are prizes. The uh, grand prize is $100, and it goes down from there. The theme is liberty and justice for all. The winning artwork will hang in the uh, court for a year, and then it, uh, it's very possible it could hang longer. And um, anyway, go to the city's webpage. There's more information, because there is, are details about how big the artwork can be and some other information you would need. 
The Arts Commission is also working on an upcoming e event called the Blue Poppy Days, Art in Bloom. It's Saturday, May 18th from 10 to 4 at the Rhododendron um, Garden. It is the second year that they have done that. Local artists will be there as well as gardeners to help us all learn how to garden better. Um, Earth Day, I know other people have talked about it, but Earth Day is happening this Saturday and we have several parks that you could volunteer in. Celebration Park, Lakota Park, Olympic View Park, Sacagawea and Steel Lake. And also Park Pals sent me an email that um, they will be having a work party at French Lake Park from 10 to 1 on Saturday. The rest of the parks, the hours are from 9 to 12. And it would be helpful if you bring your own gloves and any tools that you would like to use. I um, want to thank the staff for their help with our event that we had at 6.30 tonight, the uh, recognition of our commissions and committee volunteers. You guys did a wonderful job. Thank you for all that you did. And if anyone is interested in, in uh, volunteering for a city commission, we do list the availability of um, commission that have openings. They're on the city's webpage, and they are also in the Federal Way Mirror. And um, it is a great way to get involved in the community and learn how the city operates. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Councilor Hahn, and also thank you for your leadership of putting this event together. I know that no one probably knows better than you the amount of time and sometimes sacrifice that our commissioners have to do in, this, in, uh, in helping all of us in terms of some of the major issues that we discussed. And so uh, on the, from the standpoint of the mayor's office, we'd just like to thank you for helping organize this tonight because uh, your effort was very much appreciated. All right, Kelly. Okay, well, thank you. Um, I <coughs> want to uh, also express my gratitude to the Lions Club for um, a wonderful event that they put on with the, uh, the, with the guns and, I think it was called Guns and Hoses, right? The, that event? <laughs> Brian? Um, the basketball game was great. It was really great. Um, and I really enjoyed it, and I liked seeing Ben getting all excited about the game as well. Um, I also attended Westway Soccer uh, Field Grand Opening, which was put on by the uh, by St. Francis and um, Boys and Girls Club. They reinvented the the uh, park there, and they made that a, a nice um, field for the the children who live in that community. And since we've heard a lot about Westway to to Dight, um, it's nice to be able to um, express that as well. Um, I, you know, I could just go on. I'm the last on the list, so I've, I've got a, a lot of the same things to say, but one thing, a couple of things that weren't mentioned yet. Um, <clears throat> Muya Gramberg, uh, Muya, how do you say that? Muya Burgers uh, had their grand opening the other day, and it was a lot of fun. The burgers are great. I recommend them. Uh, but aside from that, it's another establishment that's decided to come into Federal Way, and it's uh, fantastic for our community. So um, it w I was very excited to be there. Uh, last but not least, uh, Advancing Leadership Youth had their graduation last night, um, and uh, it was it's just wonderful to see the kids in this community coming together and um, helping out um, and doing and creating events um, and community initiatives to drive the community forward. So I appreciated that. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councilor Maloney. Thank you very much, Councilor Maloney. Um, I usually don't give a report at the end, but I would like to say that we do live in a world of instant communication, and we did find out that at 8.04 today, the Senate passed the metal theft bill, and it is now going to conference. And so uh, my thanks to staff uh, for all their work, uh, that as well as the work of Senator Idy, who has really taken a leadership role in the Senate on this metal theft issue. And already we heard examples tonight, again, about why this is an extremely important piece of legislation. and. Uh, so from that standpoint, uh, my thanks to everyone for their work uh, on the council as well as staff. And on that happy note, this meeting is adjourned. <laughs>